And welcome back. So, we last left off at chapter 11. Um, before we proceed, I figured it was perhaps a couple weeks ago, so it'd be a decent time to recap, um, I guess at the very least, the players and what we know so far. Um, according to my <laughs> uh, theories and, and such, but um, also just uh, for the sake of uh, memoriz memorizing. So in the first session, we more or less were introduced to the concept uh, in which the four girls were kidnapped um, from Charlotte Shaw and uh, were never seen again. And then we flashed, flashed forward to the future and we met the four friends that were coming together to try to solve the case all these years later uh, that became an infamous one from the place they came from. Um, so, the four girls, Maj, Annie, Malin, and Charlotte Lund were the victims. And by jumping back through the various flashbacks over time to the memories of the boys, we got to see them hanging out with them um, you know, getting up to their antics, chilling on the beach, wiling out a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, we even got to a point where the boys discovered that they're like, oh, the next time these girls want to kind of party with Cherry Speed. Right? <laughs> they were like, yo, let's, uh, let's do some of that. Those amphetamines, you know? So kids like, will be kids, I guess. Yeah, in the, in this world? <laughs> Right in a world of the pale, yeah, it's so it seems. Um, so yeah, of course, it's not just detectives and random uh, uh, um, communists rocking drugs. <laughs> it's also the children. So um, that was going down. Um, we also then met, uh, yeah, the four, uh, I guess, main characters of our story. So Anayat Khan. Uh, the more nerdy, shy history nerd. Uh, you know, he was not he was not too talkative, but they would be like, hey, tell us your stories about, you know, this emperor or about mm -hmm. this moment in from history. And then, like, they'd do that to, like, and try to impress the girls. Um, he was the one who was living in his mother's basement. Uh, he had his uh, pride and joy, the Harnanker, the model ship that he built fully detailed. Right. And he was also pretty much a loser um, out in public on a date in an environment where his only lifeline was Jesper, right? His, cool guy. his friend that he grew up with. And Jesper was the famous rich pretty boy designer. Lots of, lots of friends in high places, lots of access. Um, and, uh, you know, he's the one that uh, he was definitely like a adventurous as a kid too as well but uh, as we discovered later on that he was dating 19 year old Anita Lundquist and they had been dating for four years which definitely puts that in fucked up illegal territory yeah. um, and establishes a few things about these characters that uh, we can start to put a few pins on the board and say that um, after the girls disappeared, they all were traumatized and did not get over it in various ways, and that comes out in all kinds of fucked up examples, and for him, I think it's a pretty clear case in point of he his brain never got out of that childhood yeah, he's stuck in it. obsession. Mm. And um, that fucking creepy pedo-ass shit that we get introduced to is kind of just like, def it's kind of like matter-of-factly introduced. And Anita Lindquist is also like kind of a celebrity. She's a real model and stuff. So he has access to that world by being a famous person and such. Um, and then in that same chapter, we also find out that he's also the kind of fucked up individual that will like tell a lie to try to keep her when she's about to walk out on him, right? After they have a big blow up fight. But uh, in some more than in, in some fucked up ways, that lie becomes real. Um, more on that in a second. There's also uh, 
Teresh, the unhinged detective haunted by the memory of the girls the most who kind of like gets together with everybody and kind of has the big reunion to say like let's let's get this thing solved let's figure it out um and he's the one that we see uh again unhinged and and uh he's the user of zaum he's the one who knows how to use it zaum being the uh, uh, the memory machine, right? The thing that can that can pry you open and extract your thoughts, get whatever information is needed from you. In a um, very gruesome way. In a very gruesome way, it involves uh, syringes, tubes, liquids, all, and it, and it and it leaves you fucked up afterwards, and you and hung over. Um, and uh, when we uh, first see it used, it is against. Uh, their first lead, Vidkundhurd, who is a uh, giga-Nazi, uh, child rapist, super fucking in jail forever, uh, uh, psycho. And uh, by using it on him, they're able to, he's able to extract information uh, to find out that he is not, in fact, the murderer, but he does know things, and he spoke to uh, his former uh, cellmate, and his cellmate knew things as well. Um, so they were able to like get the next lead from using it on him, uh, Teresh in particular. Uh, it, it's as it says it, it pries Vidkin to open. Um, from that, they get the name Derek Trentmuller, who they then uh, track down. And uh, unlike Vidkin to heard, Derek Trentmuller is uh, 70, senile. He's in a nursing home. He's basically barely there. Um, and that entire uh, chapter is uh, a really, like, it, it, it switches back and forth between the perspective of the main characters as they try to get what they can out of him. And he seems to indicate that, like, he knew about um, a group of people in, or, or a person known as the Linoleum Salesman. Uh, they're then un basically, like unable to get much more out of him because he's just a damaged figure. His memory is partially destroyed. He's also just apologetic and pathetic and fucked up. And um, after leaving, they go and actually are able to uh, use... They, they basically are able to put together that um, his name appears on the hotel registry of people who were overlooking the park where the girls were and then we go back to a memory and see that uh derek trent moeller was in he was in a, a penthouse apartment looking down he was able to take pictures of from the girl of the girls from high up and in that moment we also uh read about him like we read about the fact that he sees the girls and he decides and it's the happiest moment of his life and he kills them but uh, or he decides to kill himself, but first he kills them. Uh, we learn about the fact that um, you know they're dismembered. We learn about the fact that there was some sort of fucked up chimera uh, thing done that more or more like a like a human centipede thing, um, and that uh, while that was occurring, the youngest died, so the others were still alive. Um, and then we learned effectively that I guess he apparently hung himself. And uh, that was the end of the linoleum salesman. Um, but not clearly, uh, using Zaum, they go back to Derek, and it seems as if Teresh is uncertain as to like what it what they get from the memory. But um, he seems he comes out of it convinced that it's like, oh, it wasn't him. But at the same time, there is memories of him being there and of him taking the photos. Um, and then the weirdest part about the whole thing is that even though his memory is fractured, Derek's memory is fractured and such, there's the photos they physically took that are also erased and starting to be wiped by either the pale or the concept we were introduced earlier in the book, which is the memory hole sort of like deliberate deleting of certain things, right. certain concepts, certain people, certain ideas. There's a way for them to be deliberately targeted targeted and wiped um obviously i would say using the pale but uh that's what we were uh kind of introduced to was the idea of the photos that he took disappearing themselves 
Um, I think outside of that, there's... Um, what else was there? Yeah, that was, that was pretty much it. Um, and... Oh, um, <laughs> there was also Mahayek, the fourth friend. Um, which I, I don't... We don't have a ton of details on him at, at this point, or, or, or so. Um, but he's around, and maybe I just uh, overlooked a, a crucial note at, at some point, and we can revisit that. But for now, he's the fourth one that's around with them. Um, yes, and to the end that the pale can be used in this way, or is circumstantially being used in this way, um... We also briefly, for a moment, um, in the scene where uh, uh, Jesper is suddenly about to get dumped by his 19-year-old girlfriend, and, and she's, like, blowing up at him and, and uh, you know, accurately calling him uh, uh, a child abuser and such, and she's about to walk out, he says, um, and go what, back to your home? Your home doesn't exist anymore. And then she's like, what are you talking about? And she's like, there isn't. And he says, there is no Revishal. And then it describes it as like, he tells a lie and he doesn't really know where it's going to go. And then suddenly just believing in it, they turn on the radio and we do discover that in fact, Revishal no longer exists. Um, the innocence of the time, Ambrosius St. Miro in a very matter of fact, kind of, again, single chapter maybe or, or, or section of a chapter maybe like three or four you know little uh, paragraphs long he describes that um, he is multiple things he's what the people asks for he's God's will he's all of uh, the, he's the natural conclusion of nihilism and what it leads to and he decides to erase Revishal from the map and everything that we know and anything we're connected to with Disco Elysium is gone. Right, okay. That's it. Um, the game makes reference to this event at a point in the future after the game takes place, but uh, here it's a footnote in a chapter, and we move right back into the current Isola, and that's it. Um... Yeah, so that's a that's a real fucked up thing, and and you know it it is uh, I guess like when you do learn about the innocences and the history of Dolores Day and everything in Disco, it is seemingly the most impactful and important part of the of the history of the world, right? The innocences are the ones that move nations, that rewrite the borders, that start wars, end wars, control push forward the moral in turn all of that is based around the idea of the church and the holy innocence so the fact that um it ends with one as well is like yep that seems like it's right on 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 uh, uh par with the rest of the way we learned about that uh so there you go there's your single mention of of uh the world that we knew and uh, i suppose the characters that we were attached to uh, and that's my notes. Thank you for that brief recap. Mm -hmm. Back to this world and this mystery where we're not quite sure, but we know the linoleum salesman did it. Um, they pry open Derek and it seems like he is he, but Teresh is not sure after using Zaum. Of course, the titular uh, uh, machine named for the company as well. So let's continue. Self Chiller. In the early 50s, a young mother watches her son, her four year old son, Ulv, on the Lovisa playground. It's midsummer, the polars drop gray flakes, and the sun sparkles in the sky, but the mother is worried. Other children run around the playhouse, and boys scream and pull girls' hair. The suspension bridge of the playhouse vibrates as toddlers run on its tables. Down below, 
The girls and boys build a town on the wooden edge of a large sandbox. A girl spins a tiny airship model around the tower, and two boys dig a tunnel, one on one side and the other on the other side of the hill. The tunnel meets in the middle, and the boys laugh triumphantly. The girl is bored. She starts crying, and the other girls come to ask what's wrong. Only little Ulf sits alone, far away, on the other side of the sandbox. And when someone asks him what the solitary house is that Ulf has built on this, his huge piece of cloth, Ulf doesn't say anything. The boy just looks vaguely into the distance and smiles his mysterious childlike smile, as if he's somehow too cool for that. Too cool of a guy to talk about his house to the rest of the rascals. The others soon tire of Ulf's arrogant manner and leave him alone. The young mother doesn't understand why her child doesn't care about being in the company of others, even with his own parents. Ulf has not exchanged more than ten words. He does not speak, but only when he's alone with himself. Sometimes the mother listens to him from another room and doesn't understand what's wrong with her little boy. A distant street parade is heard, and the bass drums thump. Nts, nts. Ulf sits proud, sits in proud solitude in the corner of the sandbox, moving his curly head back and forth to the rhythm of the music. It seems almost as if he's self-chilling. It's Wednesday afternoon in the forest near Jesper's house. This time Khan is leading the way, and the others try to keep up with him. He's heavily caffeinated and hasn't slept all night. Until the morning, he tapped on Harnan Kerr's buttons, made coffee and long-distance calls, and listened to sad songs until his mother asked him to turn the volume down. Khan waves his hands while speaking. His orange coat is open, his orange coat open, and a turquoise orange violet strapped, striped scarf in Ilmara colors fluttering. His mother knitted it for him in the winter solstice and the tutu pom-pom hat for his ber previous birthday. It is also in Ilmara colors. They come as a set. The forest path winds beneath, between the hills and tall pines on either side of the road. Three abreast, Jesper on the right tire track, Tarish on the left and Khan straight in the middle of the grassy tuft. They come down the hill on the snowy sand of the road. The hay is patterned with gray rustling underfoot. Single snowflakes are flying in the air, and the dried late autumn nature sparkles. Khan takes a deep breath of fresh air. The moss decays. He clasps his mittens together, which go over his back with a string. I've never believed in a criminal solution. You know that. Every step forward is a step forward. And in that sense, it's a course great to chase linoleum salesmen. But Teresh, sometimes I feel like you're collecting these guys. Like I collect memorabilia. You know what I mean? I don't mean it in a bad way, of course. Teresh blows a big silver gray smoke ring and makes Astra rings in the middle that the quiet wind carries away. I don't mind. You're right, too. You collect that stuff because... You think you'll find something about the girls there. I collect my monsters for the same reason. And what do you collect, Jesper? Khan asks. I don't collect anything, you freaks. But it's still nice for a man to have a hobby. Hey, what's next? Well, we'll have to search Trent Moeller's property and interview relatives. Tadesh lists on his leather-gloved fingers. But you saw that he didn't do it, right? The forest path turns and light brown hay brushes over the rails like someone's hair and rustles under Jesper's feet. Or are you not sure? You can never be sure in Captain Pepe Popicarnaso's psychedelic cabinet. The hyper-interactive Khan sits, uh, cuts in and turns around. Walking backwards a few steps, he explains to Teresh, that's why the court doesn't count Za'um as evidence. It's psychedelia. You see, it's not enough on its own. Reality has to correspond. They have to be witnesses. There have to be witnesses and things. It's all pointless anyway. Well, I wouldn't say it's completely pointless. Tarash throws a cigarette butt under the trees, and the orange spark bounces off. But you're right about Pepe Popicarnasos. His test subjects' fantasies and reality get mixed up. It seemed to me like it was more of an aspect of him. 
One that ceased to exist, or if I have the time. I should get the local authorities to investigate these things. But right now, as you say, it's basta? Khan asks. Right now, it's basta. Yes. Very good. Because let's be honest. Which of you wants to find them in some ditch? Seriously. It's not a goal in itself. It won't accomplish anything. Khan smirks and waits for answers, seeing Tadesh raise his hand. I do. And it's a goal in itself. Have you heard of closure? That concept? Jesper still thinks of Pepe Poppy Caranasso's synthesizer as an overrated futurist self-gratification. Do you have anything better to offer? Tempest Rev? We do it right this time? Not a bad idea. Honestly, I wouldn't say no. Now come on. Khan, be reasonable. Tadesh lights another cigarette, and there's a smell of sulfur in the cold air. Time is running out. We've lost contact with Revachal and Occident as well. Half the world is on the back foot. If war breaks out, all investigations will be halted, and documents, papers, and people may disappear. We have to work quickly, tie up all loose ends before it's too late. Three small silhouettes move through the overgrown fields, balancing and shifting as they argue over a log fence. Ice drifts along with the stream underfoot. They jump over fallen trees in the dim forest tunnel and move in a line on the white meadows. Khan goes through the barbed wire, and, yes and Jesper jumps over like Tereshek Tereski, clearing fall behind. The forest thins, and the sandy road lies below the tree roots like a tiny canal. Already the sea wind rustles above the treetops, and the expanse of the water can be felt in the air. We've been doing your thing for so long, and nothing has come of it. Give me a chance now, Khan explains with more gestures than words. Okay, you're right. That, that it's a dead end, Tereshi admits. But just tell us the plan and let us think about it. If I think something might come out of it, then okay, we'll do it. If not, then we have to take a break. You don't understand, shrugs Khan. If you say no, we'll never know. If there's no other options anymore, there are no other options anymore. I can't take the chance that you'll say no. Let's take it up. Let's take a little trip before, huh? Let's go to a professional. We should have contacted them long ago. It's urgent now. What do you mean there are no other options anymore? Jesper doesn't understand. But what about Melon's letters? Someone had to send them. The handwriting matched. At that age, there should be some development. If a 13-year-old writes, then their handwriting may not be 100%. The same at 15, 95% is very promising. I've read about it. Right, Tadesh? Yeah, that's, that's right. Khan jumps in. But you know what? I have an idea of how we can straighten this out. We just should wait for it now. Now. We have to act right away. Excuse me. We just shouldn't wait for it now. We have to act right away. What idea? Well, I put an ad in a newspaper. Tresh walks in his 50s-style fish-tailed coat, and he looks like a true koiko, and his mouth is slightly opened in thought. This may not be such a bad idea. When did you put the ad in? I submitted it the day before yesterday. It should be out today. I put your number there, too. Jesper, in case I'm not, I'm not at home. And what did you write there? That if anyone has any information, come forward. Nothing bad will happen. Help us out, you know. Such a thing can be more effective than you think, Tadish explains to Jesper, especially with old things like this. But you still have to fish in different columns for months and months. Where'd you put it? In Doggins and the Capitalist. I didn't have more money. By the way, if you both you both owe me fifty each. And for the advisor I'm recommending, he needs it too. And for the trip. You should take at least a thousand. He's very expensive, very highly rated. I've been waiting so long for this, reading about him. Jesper becomes impatient. First, he definitely doesn't want to go anywhere now. And second, he already senses whose money is at stake here. Khan lives off the solid, solid, Solidium money from his father, who died on a fuel oil rig. And if Tadesh doesn't start an investigation, he won't be paid anything. Listen, lay it out. Which advisors are we talking about here? Three silhouettes reach the cliff edge. The expanse of the sea meets them, beyond the dried-out meadow. The hay is dotted with white snow, 
and a single group of pine trees quiver in the wind. The sky darkens as the men approach the cliff edge. Jesper pulls up his coat collar, and the sound of the water growing louder in his ears. He often walks he often walks the six kilometers here alone. From this spot they can see what they all long to see. The strip of Charlottesville Beach, shining blue on the other side of the bay, in the snowy distance. Khan leaps on the wooden fence and looks down. The crashing waves hit the rocky wall. The water curves and the white wave crest breaks into a million foam clusters. Drops on the man's glasses blur his vision. Jesper appreciates the autumn waves. They come once a year, and now he has a clear plan. Let's go. He'll tell the girl he's going to, and he'll think of something else for the boys. He measures the wind. Self chiller, Khan says. It's the last chance to talk to him about the girls. Jesper starts laughing, but Teresh is serious. Wait, wait, wait. He confirmed Abadanizi and Dobreva's skeletons with a kilometer accuracy, within a kilometer accuracy, Khan explains. What's more, two years ago they followed him. T- they followed his hint to find Cornelius Gerdy in Corpus Mundi. The chain he brought out has now sunk into the pail, but they found Gerdy's dishes and a campsite nearby. A hundred years of references. The self chiller Jesper lives in Lemminkainen, a country house in the woods, and we're going there. On the lead gray sea, it's snowing, and the temperature is at zero. The wind in the bay is less than 10 meters per second, and the next two weeks we'll see storms in western Kato, right on the edge of the pale, causing the ocean to surge. A two-week window, perfect conditions. Jesper already feels how the water mass on the Charlottesville beach, 10 kilometers away from here, breaks into waves. Waves, more bef- waves move before his eyes, long and stable, like beautiful thoughts. Okay, Jesper says, but I have a conference, design stuff, from Thursday to Saturday. And by the way, going to Lemminkainen is not a good idea right now. Or maybe you don't know? Little Ulv is nine years old when modern dance music is born in Oranje. Johann Hauer, Reitveld, and Arno van Eyck spin records in university halls at Vesper in Viderland, the world's first discotheque. Das Baum opens on a summer evening in Messina's Arcade Square. After the most epic set in human history, the ecstatic crowd crowns Theo van Kock the innocence. Uv comes home from school with a backpack on his back. He is in the fourth grade, sitting alone in the back of the class, because Ulf doesn't care about what the teacher is saying. Mathematics and science do not interest Ulf. Stupid girls do not interest Ulf. Only one thing in this world interests him. With his mouth open, he stands in front of Fonopo's door on his way home in Vastermalm, where music lovers come and go. Theo van Koch's Coma Remix plays from an old machine, and music lovers watch as little Ulf rocks and dances like he's possessed. Tears flow down Ulv's cheeks, and the whole world disappears. Everyone laughs and looks on in awe as the little boy bounces and flails, sways, puffs, waves, and roars. Wow, isn't this something? He slams his hands and feet in the air, smacks the car hood with his palms, and just can't understand. How can it be so good? How could it be that good? A salesman with a trendy sweatshirt comes out of the store from the pale of lost things from the coma echoing across human history Ulv steps up to the young man and he hands Ulv a stereo 8 tape Theo van Kock reads the cover Comte de Perus Maitresi this is the first and only time in Ulv's life that a living person has been valuable to him The grooved tire of the motor carriage is spinning and the snow rustling under the wheels is rustling under the wheels, but Inayat Khan is not there. He's 13 years old and stepping onto the veranda of Teresa's father's villa into the apple orchard. 
It is dark and crickets are chirping. The self chiller puts a stereo eight tape into the player and two plastic discs are spinning. The sound check is underway, but the June night is quiet and the music does not carry far. This is 20 years later and far away from an Ayat Khan. The air is filled with scents and he approaches the boy like a spirit from under the trees, circles around his knees and smells of early ripening apples. Khan steps barefoot into the dewy grass. The boys are sleeping inside the second floor, inside on the second floor, but he can't sleep. They went to work together at half past seven in the morning. Khan's body is tired from construction, but his heart is restless. The money is not enough. Dealer Ziggy was throwing astronomical amounts on the phone, 300 real. Jesper took his collection of Man from Hyamdal adventure novels to the antiquarian bookstore after much persuasion. Khan sold his binoculars. 16 stroke combustion chambers are kicking in the heart of the machine. In far off Lemminkainen, the window panes of the farmhouse tremble in bass rhythm, in bass rhythm. Check, check. But Anayat Khan is not there. An apple falls to the ground in front of him. Little Anayat wipes the apple clean with his sleeve and sits down on the garden bench. He bites into the fruit and feels the sweet pain kicking in his heart, making it hard to breathe. It's the feeling of slipping possibility that grows all day and makes itself in the evening. Speak. You always have such a cool have such cool presentations in history and natural science. Dark green eyes, incredibly kind and so very interested. Are you sure, Khan? Try to be reasonable now. There's no point in lowering yourself for nothing. The hood is streaming. The engine belt is running. The tape is sliding against the magnetic reader. But it's still quiet in the apple orchard. And Ayat Khan doesn't believe in God. Especially. God was supposedly invented by someone named Pius more than 3,000 years ago in Ilmara. Maybe. But now, Khan throws the apple core into the bushes, puts his hands together, and prays. Please make me likable to Malin. God, please make me really likable to her. Not just, you know, you're God after all. I promise that when I won't think of, the, I won't think that some man, pious from per, per Carnassus, invented you. I promise that I'll believe that you existed since the beginning of time and drawn the sky and earth with your uh, golden compass or something. Sorry, God, for joking like this about you, but you see, it's really hard for me to believe that you exist if I'm not likable to Malin Lund. Khan looks up at the sky. In the darkness of his heart, love spins and spreads like stars. Love, like a smooth-haired cat, curls up inside his stomach. To him, love is also a fear of loss. The red glow of the taillight stains the snow with blood. The engine muffler crackles. The chain tires whiz on the snow, and the engine roars for a moment. Gear change. The tone rises. Acceleration presses the daredevil driver into the seat. The young man's fingers are frozen to the levers and the racing goggles on his head. He's in a driving helmet. The unlit mountain road is reflected off the hard surface of the, go of the glasses and disappears under the wheels. The atmosphere is swirling above Lemminkainen, Entrop Entropenetic Catastrophe Zone. Dark mountain ranges with snow-dappled peaks cut the horizon, their teeth bared like those of a linoleum salesman. In the valley below, clearings and spruce forests stretch out, while a black motor carriage speeds along the winding road at 150 kilometers per hour. Damn, this is sick! Khan exclaims. Tadesh nods, the fumes from the engine filling the cool air of the cabin, which is industrial and acidic. The agent looks out the window, watching the snow-covered roadside posts fly by in the blizzard. In the valley below, a white mass looms, dotted with clearings. Khan hops over to the opposite seat next to Tadesh and takes the last sip from the wine bottle. The strong drink jostles his senses, and he thuds against the cabin wall. Gone. 
He shows Therese the empty bottle. Another bottle of flavored berry wine appears in Khan's hand. The twist-off cap pops with a snap. Sugar, 25%. He grinds the sugar beneath, between his teeth. In the distance, on the opposite slope, flickering lights shine in the dark. All the other vehicles are still moving in the opposite direction, away from the entrepreneurial catastrophe since Wednesday evening. That was when Khan, Agent Mahayek, and the crazy rally driver Kenny, just Kenny, set off from Vasa. What's your name? Kenny. Kenny Kuka? Vain Kenny. Katu. Entrepreneur. Entrepreneurism, Roha, Roma Duxin, Viochik. Et voilà, et voilà, Kutsetkin Rupi Taivasen Ajuman, Satana, Ihan Kuin Nisanoi, Senkiala Taiti Naha, Nahda, Jatalot Mios. Shouts Kenny from the driver's seat. Oh, that's a note. There sure are. I apologize for the massacre that just occurred. <laughs> In Finnish, Kenny. Kenny who? Just Kenny. Heavens, the entrepreneurial collapse zone can't be. The fir trees are drifting skyward. Satan, just like they said, you'll have to see. And the houses, too. It's going great. It's going great. I'm not worried at all. What, the road? No, it's fine. I'm not worried at all. Oh, that might come later, right? Since this is number four. This was footnote four. Yes. I see. All right. The conversation will continue. How are you, Khan shouts back. He, unlike Tadesh, is still a little worried when the machine shakes in the darkness and the yellowish glow of the speedometer, he sees the pointer shift to 170. All right. Then note five. Iran Hienosti and the whole Khan. It's going great. It's going great. I'm not worried at all. And the road? How's the road? Eta mi katieko. E hivinon and whole diolen Khan. What, the road? No, it's fine. I'm not worried at all. Kenny doesn't... Who will lead the old and con? Worry at all. Kenny wants flavored berry wine instead. And when Khan thinks Kenny shouldn't drive drunk, Kenny says... Allah will win the light. My one poor at the drone of Joe. Mutin man no katayisin. Se ota mwa keli siti man kato. Don't worry, all right? I'm halfway drunk already. Otherwise, I'd fall asleep. It helps me focus, man. The road continues winding through the slopes of the mountains. Between the spruce trees, Kenny leans forward to stay on track in the curves. Khan only feels safe when the motor carriage plunges deep into the forest along with the village road. The sound of snow crunching under the wheels and the engine struggling to keep up the windows covered in circles of snowflakes. The dark forest walls flutter behind the illuminators. Suddenly, Kenny pulls over to the left side of the road, and Khan jumps back to his own side. The car rushes past a red grad and t telecom van. The news crew waves to Khan from behind the snow-covered illuminator, and Khan waves back. For the past two days, Khan has been drinking with Teresh in the cabin. The driver refuses to make stops. Kenny wants to break a record. He has a stopwatch in his hand, and all this time, they see the other traffic going in opposite direction. In the opposite direction. 200 kilometers from Vasa, and the traffic jam on the opposite side of the road still creeps along. People from the outskirts travel to cities and visit relatives. From the car radio, they learn that, that the same panic is happening all over Katla, Arda, and the place that everyone goes to with its magnet train station in Norkoping. Even Yelinkas, near the collapsed northern highway, has sold out tickets for the next two months. There's no way out. 
Might as well just walk across the Boreal Plateau. Slowly, the side window turned into a domed landscape with hazy ridges slipping on the horizon and spruce forests crouching. Late at night, the motor carriage took the highway, but the oncoming traffic didn't thin out. Only the road came down from the pillars in the middle of the fields where the snow thickened and the fields shone with it. Khan fell into a deep sleep, his head resting against the side window, and in front of them, in the dark, a diamond sea of headlights shone on one side of the road, and on the other side, a cold, empty highway. Only one pair of red tail lights sped towards Lemminkainen, and they were accompanied only by military convoys and foreign news agency vehicles with radio antenna units on the roofs. In the morning, he opened his eyes and saw an abandoned village passing by outside the window. Electric wires waved between the poles, and on the empty village street, a country girl rode her bike. She wore a long skirt and a jacket. The country girl looked Khan straight in the eye, with reflectors on the bike wheels shining. They were 1,500 kilometers from the Vasa border, and another 1,500 were ahead. Kenny drove slowly, and from the cabin, you could hear the ice breaking under the wheels in the puddles. The girl waved and turned onto a side road on the outskirts of the settlement. The darkness of the forest swallowed her up, and rear light of the bicycle flickered in rhythm with the dynamo. Snow was already falling heavily in the tunnel of the trees ahead. So they went, Inayat Khan and Teresh Mahayek, with Kenny, simply Kenny, the toughest guy in the taxi park. For a few hours, the boy sat quietly and watched as Sudu passed by in the passed by in the dim light. The cold stars of streetlights lit up in the distance, and the cor- excuse me, and the corrugated iron on the roofs of the houses crumbled into eternity. As the evening approached, the snow became thicker. The dark saw teeth of the mountains rose on the horizon. Villages became increasingly rare and Teresh suggested opening a bottle of flavored berry wine. Otherwise, it'll get depressing. The darkening mountain, in the darkening mountains ahead, they often saw military airships in the sky. Once, a metal bird whizzed right, abo- right over the bridge, trying to catch them in the spotlight. The air cushion threatened to turn the car over, but then the bird was gone. Only its lights still glided over the darkness of the forest, This is called an evacuation. The checkpoint stood abandoned by the roadside, the letters shining Lemminkainen above it. Across the road ran a military barrier made of concrete blocks. Kenny put snow chains on the wheels and drove around the barrier, uprooting half the field. Winter's orbit, always snowy from there on, remained behind with the checkpoint. The asphalt disappeared gradually, and so the families on sledges came towards them along snowy gravel roads to see the pale rising behind them with their own eyes from childhood is the great is their great privilege horses pulled the sledges and passing families with all their possessions waved into the funny waved to the funny little fat man with dark yellow skin and thick glasses so strange they're always waving khan says and the Grad Telecom van was far behind, under a snow cloud from Kenny's machine's wheels. No more headlights or sledge lanterns flicker in the dark forest. Only those who want to stay here are left in those farmyards, combined, dri- combined driveways, and closed village stores. In the dark looms the pale. Kuret Kosen, asks Kenny. Arma, the only Tvarmasti Arma, Muavahan Hualis Tuta. Can you hear it? The pail. It's definitely the pail now. I'm a bit worried. Teresh and Khan are listening, and indeed, there's a new sound growing beneath the wind. A sickening, rumbling, low, crackling noise. Like a wave breaking, slowly, slowly. To Khan, it sounds like the beginning of a song. He heard it in a dream. 
I'm not in Kopo anymore. They let me go, Tadesh explained, struck, his hands in front of his mouth acting as a megaphone. What? Khan can't hear at first, the noise mesmerizing. He feels the hairs on his body stand, st stand up and chills run down his spine as if he just pulled his sweater off in a cold room. They let me go from the collaboration police. I know, Khan exclaims, handing Teresh a flavored berry wine. You've been flashing the badge of someone called Somerset Ulrich all the way. How do you know? The smell of alcohol rises from Teresh's mouth into the cold air of the cabin. Because all the checkpoint guards called you Mr. Ulrich and Agent Ulrich and Somerset Ulrich. It's a missing agent whose papers I took. I have more. Teresh takes a sip, his lips reddening and sticky the sticky licking and the sticky liquid spilling from the neck of the bottle onto his shirt. Papers, I mean. And missing agents. In Kronstadt, I put Mahayek on uh, otherwise they won't pick up the trail. I thought I'd take Somerset Ulrich to Lemminkainen and leave the track. Come and get me if you can. You're a wanted man, or...? Yeah, yeah. Didn't I tell you, huh? Some guy had a heart attack from that stuff. Zaum? Or... Yes, that, says Tresh. And in front of him, he sees the rally ace, Kenny. A black mass of snow drifting slowly into the sky. The earth crunches and crackles, and the spruce trees tear themselves up by their roots. The wood screams and the soaked ore, like in a dentist's chair. The limestone boulder flies into the air, and far above, in the darkness, the first trees are wrapped in the pale. Two years ago. Khan hears the phone ringing in his sleep. It's a cold and unfamiliar voice, awakening, a false awakening. He opens his eyes, in his mother's basement and gets up, wearing only his pajama pants and slippers. He feels something is different, but goes anyway. The basement around him is strange from sleep. Things are in the wrong place. Naja Harnankar smiles horribly in her locket. Gonzu holds an immortal peach instead of a compass. It's moldy. In the middle of the room, an empty glass display case gleams on the table. Khan doesn't dare look in that direction. There's something he can't remember in its emptiness. Something wrong. The phone rings, too. How it sounds through the darkness of the apartment. From the hallway upstairs. He goes up the stairs. The hallway is asleep around him. And the phone rings on the wall. He stretches his hand, afraid. His palm becomes sweaty on the plastic of the receiver. Something forbids him to answer. But he has to. It's important. Every thread counts. So he picks up the phone from the cradle, and the hallway fills with static from the pail. It hurts his ear next to the receiver. Hello? Khan asks. But no one answers. Hello? Who is this? Please tell me who you are, he repeats. And each time, the man's voice becomes more pleading, the static louder, until it deafens him. The pressure in his inner ear goes awry, leaving only the vibration of unknown origin at its core. Silence passes through flesh and bone like waves. It's cold. Please. Big tears flow from Khan's eyes. Tell me who you are. You know who I am. The vibration emits a child's voice, saying terrible things. Khan begins to tremble and slumps into the corner of the hallway the receiver in his hand. It's not you. It's not you, he cries. The man's real body shakes with his mind. He wakes up and cries in his bed. His ear hums, and the dream continues in wakefulness. Only the airship model is back in the display case. Nadja no longer smiles, and Gonzu holds the compass. On top of the display case are dried cheese sandwiches from his mother, and cold coffee and an envelope, a morning magnet mail from Grad. Saryan Ambartsumyan is written on the sender's box, 
and inside is a single key, golden and immeasurably complex. He has two years. Ooh. So, uh, just a side note, um, earlier I incorrectly mentioned Mahayek as a person, but that's, it's Teresh's last Teresh name, Mahayek. obviously. Yeah, yeah. I, I mistakenly made a note that, uh, listed that separately, but it's, uh, Maybe it was for the pronunciation. It, it was for the pronunciation. Uh. Exactly. Teresh Mahayek. Um, yes. Uh, and yeah, so just clarifying that. Okay. Yo, you can read those syllables so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I try. You got you got the you got the localization experience <laughs> slamming those together. My brain is hitting a speed bump on every it's, single it's, one. It is very difficult. You gotta so, yeah. Ride that horse, you know. <laughs> you gotta... <laughs> hey man. Let's different hey, Kim and Harry, different skills. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ziggy. 19 years ago, in late autumn, it's 8.15, and Khan is running late for school. He hurries through the city center in Konigsmalm. The white streaks of traffic glow in the morning darkness, and thick sleet falls heavily. The boy runs with his backpack on. Across the pedestrian crossing, the horn blares and cars zoom past. He almost gets hit. Sleet droplets get in his eyes and melt on his cheeks and woolen hat. Khan runs up the stairs to the front door when something stops him in his tracks. The school's caretaker is scrubbing a big red letter O on the corner of the school facade, together with a cleaning lady. The letter is as big as the cleaning lady. A policeman shakes his head and looks up at the wall where a huge slogan reads, the whole world is in the immediate zone of an anthropogenic catastrophe. Ziggy is that kind of boy. Ziggy's the worst boy in school. Ziggy's so bad that some would even say Ziggy is too bad. He's in 10th grade, but you know what? He came to us from another school, and Sixton knows someone there, and he told us that Ziggy came to their school from another school too. Guess what year Ziggy was in? Exactly. 10th grade too. I swear. And you know what else? That school he went to before. He was in 10th grade there too. Ziggy's mother is a cheerful Vasa woman. She works at the Ministry of Education and gets on well with the Lund girl's mother. That's why the boy is able to go to school in the city center, even though he's been suspended twice. At home, he's got loads of notebooks full of all kinds of demarcation machines city maps and trajectories, but Ziggy doesn't want you to know that about him. Ziggy's father is a nihilist, a koiko, and a trunk. Ziggy is very proud of that. My father? Oh, I don't know. Nihilist, koiko, a trunk. Ziggy's real name is Zigismund Berg. Teresh once saw him in the boy's toilet, raised his left hand in his fist and said, Frantisek the Brave. Ziggy said nothing. Ziggy pissed. Then Ziggy went to the door and stood for a moment. The locks on the leather jacket rattled. Hey, dude. Listen. Yes? Shove your Frantisek the Brave up your ass. Ziggy's a nihilist and also a communist, if needed. The word bourgeois rolls off his tongue like a butterfly knife. Bourgeois, bourgeoisie, bourgeois art, petty bourgeois opinion. You're bourgeois, your bourgeois parents. Your parents are bourgeoisie. It's because your parents are bourgeoisie. It's because you are bourgeois. And Ziggy also calls teachers by their first names. Bourgeoisie larva, bourgeoisie puppy. Pederasty is a bourgeois illness. Pederasts are bourgeoisie. 
Siggy has read books and is familiar with the most beautiful names of the bourgeoisie. Poursuit, bourgeois, petit bourgeois, burker, kulak, middle class, rentier, large landowner. His influence is huge. A girl in fourth grade with pigtails comes home and asks, Dad, why is social democracy so weak? <laughs> the bourgeoisie puppy, man. <laughs> Where did you hear that? Ziggy said that social democracy is weak and communism is powerful. Why don't we have communism, Dad? But above all, Ziggy is a nihilist. He reads dialectical materialism. He says that animals are auto automatons, is a fan of behaviorism, and worships the pale and mesk's nihilistic inspiration, Ambrosius Saint Miro. <sighs> if you had even a little bit of courage, you would go down to Saint Miro as well. Ziggy talks about his homeland in revolutionary fervor. This is no longer a part of Ziggy. Ziggy lacks a homeland. His geography teacher sent him to the principal's office, and Ziggy stopped at the door, the locks on his leather jacket rattling. We'll see you in the pale, he said, and ran his index finger across his throat. Back when the school did not yet discuss entrepreneurs, many gathered around Ziggy during recess, and the hallway echoed with his half-truths. The pale is made from the past, he said. All lost things are mixed up there, sad and abandoned. The pale is the world's memory of the world. It accumulates at the end of the matter and wipes everything off its path. This is called an entrepreneurial collapse. But when will it happen, Ziggy? Yes, Ziggy, when? During your lifetime, little old Ollie. Or at least I hope so. History swallows up the present. The world made of matter disappears. Desperacito. That's why there's no point for our generation to go to going to school. There'll be no future. When you grow up, you don't have children like your underdeveloped bourgeois parents. You'll end up seeing them die and that's all. Compared to the pale, there's only a little bit of world left. Eventually, the Asolas will sink tens and hundreds of square kilometers of landmass. You'll understand. Like a ship sinking into the pale. <sighs> Ziggy makes a sinking ship with his hands. The leather jacket locks and rattles, and the children gasp. Don't worry, Ollie. It'll all be the highlight of it'll be the highlight of all mankind. Ziggy is smoking in the school toilet in the cloakroom corner. Ziggy has a Sprechgesang band, and the leader of the, of the hobby group made a big mistake when he let Ziggy perform during the winter solstice. Ziggy Sprechgesang like a machine gun, 400 bullets a minute. Hook. Smoke cigarettes in the school toilet in the corner of the cloakroom. Abracadabra. In the, in the lobby. Oh, yeah. In the lunch queue. First verse. It's a nasty morning. It's dark. Tired to be. It's snowing. My spirits are low. And right in the corner of my house. Mum can't see. A cigarette in front of me. Mmm. You get the idea. I'm getting kind of fancy. A cigarette in front of me. It's warm inside. And everything disappears. Hook. Abracadabra. School toilet. Cloakroom corner. Abracadabra. Vanish like the world. And so on. In January, Ziggy was expelled from school. And mind you, it wasn't because of his obscure rhymes. In the tolerant educational environment of Vasa in the 50s, such Sprechgesang-ing was seen more as a natural part of the process of coming of age. The point was that Ziggy was a drug dealer. That's why he came to the school in the first place. No one expected such a thing at the time, and Ziggy was more than aware of it. He acted fearlessly, right in the classroom, talking about his deals openly and loudly, handling, handing out samples, reaping the rewards of Vasa's naivete, like Vidkunhurd 
or the linoleum salesman. He consumed himself too, came to class drugged. He was an anarchist. He was anachronist, 20 years ahead of his time. Sigismund Berg was a black bobbing stain. Then when the police finally caught up with him, Sigismund immigrated to Grad, to his father. He disappeared off the radar. A few years later, his charred corpse was found in the furnace of a particularly depressing apartment block. Chapter 13. Chemical Romance. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Chemical... <laughs> <laughs> Brain autocorrect. <laughs> that was a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Not mine. Couldn't be mine. <laughs> Maybe yours. <laughs> Chapter 13 Chemical Marriage. With a blonde strand of hair annoyingly in his eye, eyebrows crinkled from the sun. Little Jesper de la Gardie stands in the transport hub of his timeless consciousness. Everything leads here, and everything goes out from here. He wears a white sailor suit for the occasion, with a navy blue striped sailor hat in his hand, nervously bending it. Jesper is 13 years old, with a bottle opener in his pocket, a monogrammed handkerchief, 24 speed pills, and a lily bouquet on the bench next to him. All previous time flows into this place, the Charlotte Shaw Horse tram stop, and everything that follows goes out from here. It is July 1st, year 52, and Jesper stands on the edge of a summer evening under the white arch of the Funk Waiting Pavilion. He is afraid. While the rattling of the wagons is heard as roller coasters gradually lift him to its acceleration ramp since last Sunday. And so it has been all week, the height, the feeling of dizziness laying ahead. And falling, he is indescribably excited. The first tram comes, but there are no girls on it. The boy feels a strange relief, like when he was too short for the Steel Mountains three years ago at the Revachal Amusement Park. The danger has passed, but still, even the next tram brings passengers to the stop and there are no girls among them. The feeling turns his stomach upside down. Disappointment. What if they don't come? It's half past eight, and they were supposed to be here an hour ago. You have to be at least this tall to ride the steel mountains, little boy. Jesper rises on tiptoe and takes a sip of beer for courage. Beer is a terrible idea. He knows it. Beer makes you smell like hops. This is a terrible idea, Tadesh. Beer stinks. Chicks hate beer. But after a week of construction work, a 300 real payment to the school's worst boy, Ziggy, to redeem the mystical pills, after buying batteries for the record player, flowers, and God knows what else, Tadesh was right. He said, We don't have any more resources, Jesper, and we can't go there dry. We just can't. So they stood in front of the beer stand. A helpful boatman licked his lips and dreamed of his share. The seller looked at the three mischievous boys from under his brow, and the boys watched as the foaming liquid flowed from the cistern into paper cups. Like piss, commented Jesper. Khan took the half-liter bottle into his brown hands and watched as Jesper drummed his fingers against the edge of the sailor's cap. Shut him up and drink. Your hands are shaking, Khan said. Mmm, you've been drinking piss, if I'm not mistaken. Jesper replies teasingly and sniffed his drink. We thought we'd keep up the facade of virginity, but here you are, reeking so elegantly of piss. Khan, with a low tolerance for jokes, chuckled as he drank the foul-smelling beer. Now he nervously paces at the top, kicking small stones across the road. Every so often... A beachgoer throws a nasty glance at him from across the street as, stone hits, as a stone hits their leg. The boy apologizes and tries to dry the front of his shirt in the sea breeze, where the beer stain is still drying. Does it stink, Jesper? Tell me, is it noticeable? 
It stinks, yeah. It stinks really bad. And it's noticeable too. Look, when's the next round coming? It's coming at nine. Another 20 minutes. No, don't tell me. Go look. Jesper frees himself from Khan and empties his cup. The paper cup flies towards the trash can and bounces narrowly past the edge. Damn it. Tadesh, speckled with, guns, with sunspots like a devil from the construction site, bends his knees and dances in his shoes that are tied at the ankles. He has a portable record player with leather straps on his back. The cream-colored plastic embossing reads boldly, Mono. The machine is huge and weighs more than a load of bricks. In his hands, Tadesh bounces heavy batteries. So is it buzzing? He asks Jesper. It's buzzing for me. Jesper is buzzing a little, but not much. It's good. The point of courage is not to get hammered. Just the edges needed to be sanded down. Tadesh pontificates. He's probably the only one who isn't bothered by an hour-long delay off track. We, the potato-colored Koiko Rabs, who have survived through the genocide of the and the Yugograd massacre on the buzz of alcohol, as long as we have the smell of hoppy beer or flavored berry wine in hand, we're not afraid of anything. Khan takes the chrysanthemum bouquet from the bench, and now they all sit in a row of three, tapping the asphalt and clapping their knees, uncoordinated, arrhythmic. The sound of creaking rails comes from behind the slope and Tadesh nervously squeezes his bouquet of seven red roses. The sound of hooves gets closer. The horses are already on the slope and the coachman's silver badge shines in his hat. The buzz seems to disappear as Tadesh nervously picks, up, picks at the silver paper of his bouquet. He didn't skimp. Seven red roses, a full hand. If only he'd also bought a set of a box of chocolates, such a fancy one with gold embossed writing, like in a grad novel. If only he hadn't run out of money. Something flashes from the train cabin, from the tram cabin. Out of the corner of his eye, Teres sees Jesper stand up. Let Jesper take care of his lilies, and Khan can fumble with his chrysanthemums. Roses, red, seven pieces. That's chic. Rose i bomboniera, bardzo i borni, Teres Maszczek. The tram doors fold open with a sharp metallic sound, and the boy doesn't even notice how the thorns penetrate his clenched hands. The anticipation is vividly remembered, but the event itself is too brutal. The moment is shrouded in a veil of suspense. Something happened. Something he did. The girls, all three of them, stepped from the cabin train, from the train onto the asphalt. Their long legs and high knee socks Oh my god, what cruelty, they're dolled up. The hem of their skirts flutters, looking so casually chic, as if nothing significant is happening. Charlotte puts her hand on her hip and stops in front of him. But Teresh, unable to play along, makes a mistake and hugs the girl. His hand, his hands around her, a huge rose bouquet hanging from the back of her dress. Oh joy, the flowers are covered in golden dust. Can it be any more... Why Borni? He smells a strange scent from the girl's neck. They look at each other. Teresh and the goddess of the ninth grade. And Teresh, with a brown and red face, a silly smile on his face, says, Hi! Well, hi to you too, Charlotte replies with a boyish charm, as if nothing has happened. The girl takes the flowers, and they walk together under the pines where the, equiv where the evening sun doesn't reach. It's dim and quiet, and no one knows what to say. Outside, in the yard of the self-chiller's country house, Kenny turns the motor carriage around into a ready-to-start position. The machine's heavy gas bursts merge with the distant noise of the forest massif on the edge of the pale. The pale can also be felt from behind the stone lined walls of the large house. The machine's lights cut through the dusty window and into the cracked stone floor of the old manor house's foyer. The finger-drawn smiley face in the dust on the window sparkles. No one came to the door when they knocked. The lock was invitingly open, and flashlights hung on, the, hung on nails in the foyer. 
former collaboration police agent Teresh Mahayek, and cellar dwelling Inayat Khan now walk flashlights in hand through the labyrinth of dark rooms, garden tool racks, disassembled garden carts, and piles of old furniture pass by in the beams of their flashlights. Khan stumbles among stacks of roof tiles, while Teresh walks ahead of him, practically stooped under the low ceiling. Another uninhabited room. A large, dark kitchen can be seen through a side door, smelling of chalk and mold. Piles of bottles and something that looks like half a bar of smoked sausage flicker there. Khan calls out the owner's name fruitlessly from time to time. Are you sure we're in the right place? asks Teresh. Khan is sure, and Teresh feels like he hears distant, muffled chaos amid a catastrophe. The ringing approaches and phases in and out like an illusion, but it doesn't come from outside, where the roots of trees rustle in the ground and electrical wires sizzle in the sky. It comes from inside the electricity-free house. Teresh sits on a pile of old papers and observes the room around him in a beam of dust-filled light. He's still a little tipsy from the berry wine, but the darkness sobers him up. Doors surrounded by various debris lead in all four directions. He thinks he can hear the low hum of a generator in the distance, in the heart of the house, and he sets his sight on it. Struggling with a jammed door, he steps into a large, low-ceilinged hall. Teresh turns off his flashlight and steps carefully over the bent floorboards. It's cool inside. The smell of gasoline cuts through the mold. Black cable bundles twist like snakes under under his shoes and continue into the dim corner of the hall where green and yellow lights flicker rhythmically. The hall is barely illuminated by candles hanging from wagon wheels, casting yellowish rays on the floor, while darkness creeps in through the window panes. Therese stands in a ray of light and feels the sound waves of the clockwork around him, cold and unfamiliar. On the plastered walls, there's equipment piled on the decks. Khan stops by the door and runs his fingers over the embossed letters. Mono. Tadesh, he whispers, Mono, and this one says Hertz. The high frequency oscillations barely quiver under his fingers. This is a discotheque, nods Tadesh. This is a discotheque. Three quarters of a century ago, the Ozon Islands were blanketed by a pitch dark night. Everything is gray, dark gray, and under a cloudy sky, black waves lap against the sandy shore. The palm fronds sway from uh, over the heads of revolutionary lovers. The coups have failed, and everything has gone wrong. Dobreva opens her darkly made-up anarchist eyes, a dried-up line of poison bulges from the corner of her mouth. Abadanaizi crunches ampoule shards between his teeth as he strokes her hair. Listen, he says. And in the pitch darkness above the water, the hypnotic rhythm of bells crackles. Slowly, the color begins to seep into the black and white world. Dance, shouts Dobreva like a little girl. She stands up and walks away. Abadanais follows her into the waves, the water splashing around their ankles. Do you hear it? Teresh asks Khan. Like a buzzing, right? Exactly. Teresh takes a candle from the end of a nail and points it towards the dim distance of the room. They move discreetly across the floorboards to the back of the hall. Gradually, rows of sliders emerge from the darkness and the, on the mixing console, monolithic speakers towering on either side of the desk and behind it. A young man with a trendy sweatshirt sits with headphones. The headband of the headphones crushes his curly hair against his head. Ulf nods his chin to the rhythm of the music, but his eyes are closed as if under high tension. Mr. Ulf, Khan whispers, I'm sorry, but... Shh! The young man puts a finger on his lips, his eyes still tightly closed. He furrows his brow so intensely that it seems like an explosion is about to burst behind his eyelids. Please don't ruin my intro. He pronounces like a vast river 
as if incomprehensible cubic meter of superhuman partying presses against the dam of self-chiller's teeth. He points his finger at the mixing console, where dozens and dozens of sliders slowly move up. This is the most important part. Khan carefully places the envelope on the studio monitor, where self-chiller points with his trembling hand. Like a bomb disposal expert, Tadesh takes a step back. He manages to read the names of the girls on the envelope. Still a well-trained agent, he doesn't fail to notice that there are two. Another envelope is hidden underneath the girl's envelope. Tadesh can't see what's written on it. He keeps quiet, and the man and Khan tiptoe through the house, and the ringing of the bells around them swells louder than the entrepenetic catastrophe outside. It seems to him that these two are somehow harmonizing. They go through minefields of moving boxes. The sound rises behind them like a shockwave, a slow-motion gunshot where everything is like it was 80 years ago. Krasmazov rises from his desk, and the world is black and white. Smoke from gunpowder rises from his mouth, and outside, in the courtyard of the parliament building, a sea of counter-revolutionaries roars. But Krasmazov no longer hears the treacherous voice of this world. The intro is ringing in the mirrors of his office. Well, what was there at the design conference anyway? Our Ackerland... Are Ackerland talked about how he wouldn't mind the war. Do you remember, Are? I made a mistake once and let him sit on the sofa with me for a design magazine cover. Now everyone thinks he did something there, including Are himself. He thinks war is more like a happening, a media experiment nowadays. And no, I can't exclude that I could have, it could have happened. He might have used the word paradigm shift for it. Jesper circles the room on the top floor of Harv Sanglar and practices to himself. After he left the office, you know, he's completely gone off the rails. He writes record reviews for Doggins, and he's deaf from nose candy. It can happen. His nasal septum has collapsed twice. You should see him. He looks just terrible, like a pig. How does he still write record reviews when he's deaf? He doesn't write them, he just paraphrases foreign ones. He lowers the grade for rock by one star and gives disco, as you, Khan, would say, two on top. Jesper stops in front of the bed and nods approvingly at the beige cube table. So what happened in Lemminkainen, you ask? Eh, nothing special. We just went with the boys, surreal stuff. It wasn't bad. I quite liked it. Snow, spruces, apocalypse. What, dear? Why'd we even go there? Well, look, there's a specialist living there. His name's Ulv, and he knows how to party alone. Few are born like that. Most people party with other people. Otherwise, it's not interesting for them. But not Ulv. Ulv is the self-chiller, or so they say. The evening comes. You bring a little drink, put on a record, dance, and chat with yourself. Like I am now, only louder. In the morning, when normal people go to work, yourself chilling. Jesper opens the frilly curtains in front of the balcony window, and outside is a dim, cloudy sky. The balcony seems damp from the rain. And what? Ah, yes, you know, the usual. He talks to the dead. That's right. A talker to the dead. They come when he plays them Van Eyck in Old Reitfeld. That's why he's alone like this. No, dear, he doesn't tolerate fucking graf. Jesper steps out onto the balcony and stands on the reed mat. He communicates with the pale, you know. Whatever that means. You understand how it, would cap it could captivate us, that thought? Yes. Because of those girls, that's right. <laughs> Derek Trentmuller looked at them from here that day. Strange. He couldn't say that it was eerie here. Completely normal hotel room. A little less sea painting could, wouldn't hurt. The snobby decorations in the hallway are disgusting, and the wallpaper is, well, still just wallpaper. Otherwise, everything is top-notch, 50s elegance. Jesper looks down from the balcony. Charlotte Sjall's soul's soul soaks in the rain there. The autumn wave washes it to the beach. The balcony is high up in the sky, on the 12th floor. Jesper stands there, alone. He spreads his arms. Don't be naive, 
Of course, not really. But the show is decent. The show is the most important thing in this field. Physics. Take them as entertainers. That's it. Where are we going for dinner? No, I don't really want to talk about it anymore. Before leaving, Jesper stands for a moment in the middle of the room, number 1212, at Havslanglar. The moss green cover of the sofa and the frilled curtains seem apricot cream in the soft light of the floor lamp. No, he doesn't have anything against it. Outside, the world is uniformly gray, and the room's feminine chic sleeps in the center. A true petit bourgeois dream. Jesper spreads his arms as if waiting for something to happen. He also takes a few provocative steps and then stands with his arms hanging at his sides. The radio's number and pad gleams on the bedside table. The clock ticks, and the curtains before the unopened balcony door billow like a sail. Please, says Jesper, looking at the room, its clean walls and high ceilings. But nothing happens. Before the interior designer goes down to the beach, he curses in disappointment to the room. Bitch. Jesper walks along the damp sand with defiant steps. The reeds rustle in the cold of late autumn. The boy's rocky outcrop, now much smaller, is blue in the midst of, wi of water droplets in the background. A slender, white surfboard cuts into the autumn sky like a saber. Jesper lifts his prized surfboard above his head. He casts condescending glances at the windsurfers on the water. One can soak naked here for two hours, then climb onto the same faded wave with ten other shaky guys. No, Jesper goes to, this, to his place. He already feels in the depth of his chest how the waves here swell, waiting for him. The skirt flutters and shines in the dimness of the pine forest, around the thin, sun-tanned legs of the 14-year-old girl. The boys walk, led by the flag of Charlotte's skirt. How long has it been going on like this? On the side of the pine forest, where the mint disappears into the dark green of the blueberries, they've never been before. Familiar places were left behind long ago. Suspension bridges and the road that led up to the rocky outcrop. Everything passes in the dimness of silence, with the occasional sound of broken conversation. Shadows grow on the dunes and on the distant horizon. The curtains of trees are slowly pulled apart. The opening field undulates in the salty sea wind. The blood orange sun comes out low over it. The hair like grass rustles as Charlotte's stockings covered legs spread out towards the sea. Six long shadows slide over the field, and the girls run relieved, and the boys run after them. Is this still Charlotte's y'all? This field? Where the reeds rise on the edges, swaying in the wind? Where the brownish beige spread of hay turns into a fine white strip of sand? Malin stops and takes off her shoes. She breathes heavy, heavily from the sea expanse, with her chest pinched in her dress next to Khan. On the horizon, the light blue mirror of the sea reflects another sun scattered like an explosion. The ink blotches of the cloud ridges, black against the light, tear apart above the water. They stand there among the reeds, all of them, hands over their eyes, and the giant reeds bend respectfully on both sides. Annie, wearing shorts, plops down on the sand, and gloomy Therese, Tresh, puts his portable record player down beside her. On the reed grass, the boy pulls out the antenna and turns on the shortwave radio to a popular youth station. Guitar pop music comes out of the speakers, utterly contrary to Tresh's mood. The girl didn't hug him back. How stiff she felt. Charlotte. How straight and tense her sandals. In her sandals. He doesn't even dare to look at her now, feeling that something has been broken in the meantime. Such a thing brings to mind the massacre of Hugo Grad. When the buzz is gone, you find out that our true heavy nature comes out. After all, we're just ordinary people with potato-colored hair 
and eyes of random colors. But Malin, the Nordic cheerfulness, lets out a happy snap of her fingers and asks Khan, Did you get it? We got it, Jesper jumps in. He looks at the girls as their faces light up when he pulls out a paper bag from the bottom of his pocket. Malin spreads the beach towel on the sand and Annie brings out six shimmering water bottles from the bag. The bottles stand in a row in the sand and Charlotte explains how this will lead to an immense thirst. How they ha will have to bring water back from the beach later. But that's okay. It will be quite an adventure for this daring couple who dares to go. The boys tremble with excitement at the word. A couple! Only Teresh was distracted. Teresh was still thinking of the genocide. Six of them in a circle, girls opposite the boys, sit on a beach towel, and Charlotte pours pills from a paper bag into her hand. The bag rattles. Noses shift closer and everyone watches as 24 crimson diamonds sparkle there. The girl throws gems from one hand to the other. The tiny little wheels jump happily. One bounces off. The girl says, oops, and Malin picks it up from the sand like a trinket. She blows on it, painstakingly, gives her older sister a reproachful look, and then runs her finger over the surface of the pill like a ruby polisher. Khan sees how the girl's lips glow. They're the color of cherry speed. Listen, be a good guy. Tell me what it is. Teresh finally bursts out in the evening twilight at the playground where the dealer Ziggy's leather jacket locks rattle. It's yesterday evening, and the boy with greasy black hair is walking on the swing. He places his hands on the swing's board on either side to balance himself. With his legs in front of each other in his jeans, he, and he begins. You know how they had say that drugs, they're a waste of health? The other end of the swing snaps against the ground as the boy goes over the center. Escaping from reality. You know, pointless bullshit? The question is rhetorical. Let Ziggy answer himself. They're right. Cocaine makes you a scumbag. Heroin, an idiot. Stay away from that crap. It dulls the mind and honestly, it's dangerous for a developing organism. It's not worth it. Ziggy jumps off the swing, sand flying from under the sneakers. But this... This specific drug, they make these generalizations because they haven't yet. He pulls a paper bag out from his back pocket and rattles it under the Teresh, Teresh's nose. Tried Samara Amph. You can't even imagine how lucky you are right now. What a waste. I don't understand why I even sell this. Why don't I just do it all myself? Ziggy's black eyes shine in the dim light. It's so new that it doesn't even have a name yet. Girls call it Cherry Speed. Boys call it Samara Amph. It comes from the Samara Republic, that's why. All good things in the world come from the Samara Republic. They bring it in through the pale, the world's first street drug invented by communists. Entrepreneurs do it there, in the pale to be fearless. But for partying, that's very, that's a very pioneering mindset, very progressive. Flying communist. That's what they call it in Grad. But me, personally, I say, you want to know what I call it? Shadows fall from Ziggy's cheekbones, and his black brows and wrinkles at the corners of his eyes form a cunning expression. Well? asks Tresh. Chemical marriage, says Ziggy. I call it chemical marriage. Little Anayat Khan is sitting opposite Malin with his legs crossed and watches as the girls pop pills into their mouth, into her mouth without any warning, like candy. The twist-off cap snaps and Malin wipes her lips clean of water. So, she asks cheerfully, what are we waiting for? Let's take them now. It'll be a good 45 minutes before they start working anyway. Waiting is boring. You took two? Charlotte is alarmed. Idiot! So what? mutters Teresh, and Khan feels a sense of fear next to his friend, the freckled absurdist philosopher. Still thinking about the Yugo Grad massacre, Teresh crunches his pills. He doesn't drink water with them. 
the saccharine sweetened, bittersweet chemical fizzing in his mouth. But Teresh doesn't care. I took two to the flying communist, he says, swallowing and stretching his arms out like airplane wings. Okay, stop, Charlotte exclaims, and Annie adds, two is too much. Start with half. What are we going to do with you now? Should we call an ambulance? No need, grins Malin. Last time I took it all at once, and it was really good. I think it'll be twice as good now. What do you think, Tadesh? I know of bank robberies for which less preparation has been done than for, for tonight. Khan suddenly bursts out, surprising even himself. Look, gas lamps in case it gets dark. He pulls three lamps out of Tadesh's backpack, whose things he now confiscates angrily. And extra water! A water-filled bladder hisses at it as it lands in the sand. Because Ziggy said that under that... Honestly, I still don't understand what its name is. All tastes become disgusting under that thing. And everything's already... I don't know. Strange. Exactly. Charlotte raises a lone raspberry-colored pill between her fingers. She looks at Khan, whose emerging leadership qualities are confusing, and declares expectantly, Skull? Skull, replies Khan. And Jesper watches as his nerdy benchmate and Charlotte grab water bottles together. Only Annie is still rolling the pill in her hands. Well? The girl looks at Jesper with her hands under her chin. Skull? Jesper throws a careless glance over at her. Summer pants with rounded cuts on the buttocks, bent knees and flip-flops hanging loosely on her feet. The, girl's chuckle, the girl chuckles, not swallowing immediately, letting the pill melt on her sharp tongue. It's sweet, disgustingly sweet, and I like it. I think I like it because I know what it does to me. You'd like it too if you knew. The girl looks at Jesper, and Jesper looks over her legs. A sun-cooled explosion over the water. A sudden gust of wind makes the reeds whisper around them, and everyone falls silent and listens. The boy puts the little wheel in his mouth and feels the saccharine sparkle on his tongue. He hesitates for a moment, then swallows. A wave of fear rises again after swallowing, and the acidic environment reacts, unwittingly breaking down the raspberry red brilliance of his ab in his abdomen. Colorants and dyes fizz. Waves wash up on the beach in front of his eyes, quietly, like in a dream. Seagulls screeching. In this dimming world, the boy with the white sailor hat is now just a traveler, at the mercy of semi-synthetics. Jesper himself surrendered, the last of all six, but voluntarily, like everyone else, he doesn't know it yet. But even now, he carries microscopic flakes of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in his undeveloped metabolism. The naturally non-existent combination of elementary particles settles inside him. Nothing here depends on him anymore. Everything depends on them. They have their plan, and there are 45 minutes left for it to work. They synchronize with him, form new patterns of behavior, and take over like quiet weapons in a secret war. But something in this psychopharmacology doesn't reach the snowstorm that ravages Malin Lund's 13-year-old body. Khan looks on, his head bowed, as the girl stand up in front of him and unties her ash blonde braid. Her hair flutters in the wind. Like a pregnant woman, she places her hand on her belly. Her metabolism is working overtime beneath the white speckled dress fabric. She already feels the morning sickness turning her digestive delicacy. Phenethalamines rush against the petal veined skin, pink skin. The final synthesis of amphetamine, the non plus ultra. Her body wants to rid itself of the intruder, but she is so brave. She holds it all inside. She's clever. She hasn't eaten all day. She's also beautiful. Very beautiful. On the glossy cover of the girl's magazine, like on an abacus, 12 gems stand in a row. There were originally 24. Charlotte took one. Annie took one. Jesper took one. And Khan took one more. Teresh took two. Let's count. Meanwhile, as the wind tussles Malin's hair, and she feels how it already floods her blood-brain barrier, her silent secret. A serotonin apocalypse whirlwind is rising. Well, what can she say? Melin Lind has a cute face and soft curves. 
She only has the best grades on her 8th grade diploma, and she really likes it when it feels good. Six of them sitting in a row with their hands on their knees, silent. Expectation. The edge of the horizon is a hazy gold. The sun sinks into the body of water, and above it, in the sky dome, is a dirty blue-green stripe. Malin measures the remaining time with her thumb like an hourglass. Behind the thumb, the sun sinks, and the sky dome above the child's head is darkening to a deeper blue with each passing moment. Stars light up there, one after the other, and in silence you can hear the sand on the water's edge sizzling under the receding wave like lemonade. Jesper is standing on a beach where there is no one else. Twenty years stretch out behind him, and waves tower in front of him and in the ocean. To his right hand in the sand, there's a white there's a white sword like surfboard, and the other hand rests expectantly on his hip. Jesper wears a rubber black wetsuit, as always. He wears a full body glove. His bright blue eyes look through the eye holes of the mask like a bank robber, and his mouth turns red from the cold in the middle of the mouth hole. The empty be beach greets Jesper every year. The coastline has changed a lot. The sandbanks have crept over time like living sand, but the basic plan always remains the same. Jesper slowly, Jesper steps slowly into the ocean from between the reeds. The North Sea's 10 degree water six, sticks tightly to his wetsuit, step by step, becoming deeper and deeper. Even though the neoprene, cold resistant skin of the suit body heat is lost to the water, it happens gradually, imperceptibly. Hyperthermia starts after three quarters of an hour. The waves beat at his waist, and the waves swell in front of him, in the dark grey twilight. Jesper crawls onto the board and starts rowing. The water splashes against the board, and the waves break around him as he rises into them. The further he goes, the higher they rise, until the man can no longer row through the wave crests. But before he lifts the sail, Jesper presses the sharp nose of the board underwater and dives. Hyperthermic icy water explodes against him, swirling around in underwater eddies. It burns in his eyes like molten metal. Jesper's coal black silhouette slides towards the bottomless sea graves and pushes the bright white line of the surfboard into the darkness. What comes next? What does it feel like? Tadesh finally asks. And when Charlotte and Annie convey to the boys the heightened physical sensations and the ecstasy that is difficult to put into words, it all shifts above them like a high pressure system in the darkening tome, dome of the sky. Khan is overcome with strange indifference to the situation. He blinks his eyes behind his dialectical materialist glasses, breathes calmly, and feels himself. His overweight body around him, the layer of fat, and his heart beating with excitement, as if it all is no longer a part of him. Malin apologetically moves next to Khan, and they separate from the group. In Khan's peaceful world, on the horizon, it's good to be calm. It seems like Ilmara's tricolor, the color combination that comes to the girl's mind in connection with Khan, appears frozen in the evening sky. Malin says this to the boy, and at the same time warns that there's a lot of frankness to come today. Then, when it comes. Very good, nods Khan, and moves ever closer to his new self, the one he has become with the help of the industrial empathogen. For the upcoming night and for the rest of his life, if he needs to, he will return to this place where everything is fine. Everything is under control. And by the way, that's where it comes from. The colors of the evening sky, turquoise, violet, and orange. They're so bright on the flag because Ilmata doesn't have the right pigments. They don't occur naturally there. That's their misfortune. And that's that the incredibly that and the incredibly bleaching sun. That's why it seems like they have bad taste. Actually, it's because of the pigments in the sun. They would like it. They would like to do calmer things, but they can't. Malin nods. You know, sometimes I just don't have anything to add, especially about something like this. I don't know anything about colored pigments, but I like what you're saying, so don't mind me, okay? No, you don't have to apologize. I know it's interesting. 
The situation with Almada's color pigments, antique airship's ability to go through the pale, and even that bullshit I told you about when I walked you home. No one needs to tell me that, Khan says. They both laugh quietly, as if hiding their joke from the others. Khan falls silent, and, rise, and raises his chin towards the ocean again. And what about you? What would you say about that it, that feeling, when it comes? I don't know why, but I'm feeling a color right now, Malin explains. And Khan nods calmly. I would say it's black, very dark. Very good darkness. Khan nods again. He's starting to enjoy the new way that Malin is opening up to him. He wishes the whole world would talk to him like this, about everything. And Khan would nod quietly in response, expressing his modest support. Inayat Khan's support. This is no joke. He feels his palms sweating, his hands going numb. Malin tells him that it's supposed to be like this. It's all completely normal. It means that it's coming soon. It's about to start. Khan suddenly looks at the creature in front of him with burning care, and the creature looks back at Khan. He wants the best for her. The girl trembles slightly, grits her teeth, and clutches her sweaty beach towel in her hands. Beautiful thoughts flash behind Malin Lin's dark green eyes, and her serot serotonergic neurons are reassembled in the intricate network of synapses. This law, this terrible thing called mood swings, original sin, and serotonin reuptake is suppressed. This chemical cycle that torments Malin Lund with its meager candy rations day in and day out, from school mornings to evening when homework is done, now stops functioning. And not only that, but the neurons pump unnatural amounts of leftover pleasure into her. The girl is infused with the ink-black, overripe clusters of delightful juice, pure liquid ecstasy. 50s guitar pop plays from the portable record player in the background. Transport proteins keep pumping more pleasure, so much that neither body nor mind can react yet. I'm scared, Malin suddenly says. It's different from last time. I hear you now, but everything else is just spinning. I don't know what. I don't know what I feel. The girl's breathing visibly quickens. She turns back to her older sister and says quietly over her shoulder, It's so hot. Lutz, please take my dress off over my head. What? Already? Charlotte quickly looks at her at her watch and unzips Malin's dress. There should still be 15 minutes left. Of course, that time can be shorter, too. Malin's voice is weak, like a broken string. My head is spinning. I can't see anything. The girl raises her hands up in the air. It's okay, Khan says calmly, not losing his nerve. The more complicated the situation becomes, the calmer Khan gets. He blinks his eyes quietly and breathes in and out. The coolness of the sea, the rippling ocean, stretches out before him, always so vast and indifferent. If your head is spinning, then close your eyes, Khan says, at least for now. He thinks it would be gentlemanly to not look in that direction. The crinkly white wrapping paper of the dress rustles in the air, and Charlotte lifts it over Melon's head. The girl gasps for air. Oh my god, I'm scared, oh god. She collapses into her sister's lap. The red lip, her red lips moving in the dark. It's coming. Khan can't keep himself from looking any longer. Melon's hair is spread out on Charlotte's dress. Her body in her swimsuit glows hot in her sister's arms, and her eyes are dilated to a mydriatic degree. Enormous black discs, pupils without even a hint of green. The five of them sit in a circle around here, and Melin looks at Khan. How can you be so calm? She asks. Khan looks away from the girl's body movements, from her joints that twitch feverishly in front of his eyes. He looks at the cold North Sea, where the sun has sunk. The dark shapes of the clouds are breaking apart. I don't know, says Anayat Khan, taking off his wet glasses and habitually wiping them with a handkerchief. I think it's working. I've been abnormally calm for a while now. Charlotte strokes Melin's head. Maybe so. My first time was quiet, too. Are your palms sweaty? Charlotte, my palms are always sweaty, but yes, they're sweaty now too. Melin snuggles into her sister's dress like cool sheets. She rubs herself in, in a crib, in a kindergarten bed, the dress fabric rustling around her, smelling so pleasant and airy. Her body is only 13 years old, but in the dim light of her central nervous system, oxytocin rivers are already flowing like postpartum bliss. 
Support and trust flow from her nascent breasts. The hormone of orgasm rises like yeast in warm adipose tissue. The girl blushes in the waves of tenderness. She loves everyone. Annie watches her sister's euphoria with envy. Ugh, you already have it so good. Oh my god, it's so good. Melon sighs. You can't even imagine how good it is. Say something beautiful. It's rustling so loudly. I'm afraid it will become really sad otherwise. That could happen. Charlotte nods her magnificent head and presses her palm against Melon's chest, but recoils in shock like touching a hot stove. Oh my god, your heart's beating so fast. Can you hear it? It's like hoofbeats. Annie buries her air in her sister's chest, listening to her heartbeat. Malin, how many did you take? Tell the truth. Two pieces. Malin lies. She didn't take two. She took six. She strokes Annie's smooth hair with one hand and finds Khan's ha hand in the air with the other. She presses it to her chest, a need for closeness, and breathes. Everything is fine. Believe me, everything's exactly as it should be. Oh my god, it's so good. She shakes her head slowly, cautiously, as if retreating from the waves of hot and cold, enraged. It flutters before her, horses' mouths foaming. The substance rages, ravages. I've never felt this good in my life. Everything is so soft. You try too. The girl presses the boy's hand firmly against her ribs. The circle closes in on Malin. Khan sits up straight above it all, lifting his plump chin toward the girl, proudly, indescribable peace regaining in his heart. It has already seeped into him before, but the feeling grows bigger and more confident with each passing moment. The dark-skinned boy looks at her from under lowered brows, his dialectical materialism glasses magnifying in blackening wheels of his eyes. He is a Serbian lion, a true Khan of nations. Malin, listen, I think it hit me too. That magic. He squints his eyes. I infected you, the girl exclaims and smiles lovingly at her firstborn. Khan exhales and feels how his breath is terribly warm against the girl, like a sword, and the world around them hums with dark joy. The atmosphere vibrates. Everything is under a noise filter, and a swarm of grasshoppers chirps, rubbing their legs against the threads from which everything is made. This throbbing heart attacks. Attack runs through everything even the soil beneath Khan's hand, and in the warm darkness of Malinlin's body, an emergency alarm sounds. A crazy Suru rally driver is hitting the tire of his car in front of the house. It gets worse and worse. High frequencies swarm in his ears. Stop for a moment. Let Kenny think why the third gear won't go in. It's worrying, really. He looks at the old crooked door of the wooden manor, and the world stops there, suspended in snowflakes for one clear moment. The gable of the house rises against the dark blue sky. Everything is calm and quiet. A return to earth. Kenny's silver breath rises from beneath his mouth into the winter silence. Seventy years ago, Nadja Harnankar stepped off the bridge into the void, her proud ball gown turning inside out fabric flapping as she fell. She drops head first, straight as an arrow, and through the hovering white gauze of her petticoat, the operata star bids farewell to the world. The Vera River flows beneath her fall, the mercury stream frothy, and from far away, the sound of sleigh bells ring out like a childhood memory. Anayat Khan exits the farmhouse door with Teresh Mahayak. The tall ex-agent looks around in surprise and silence. It's so beautiful to watch the snow floating in the candlelight of the forgotten carriage room, and Kenny waves to them from beside the car, the other hand on his heart as if in, re in relief. They two take two steps forward, and Tadesh still hears the crunch of snow under his shoe, when suddenly low frequencies explode. Kenny sees the two men abruptly turn abruptly towards the manor house. A deafening beat resounds, and the window panes rattle with its bass rhythm. Little Teresh is dancing self-indulgently, like a shaman of a tribe. He shakes his fingers in the air, which are numb and pleasant. And the world whispers around him. A gust of winds, a gust of wind makes the reeds rustle, 
cooling his sweaty forehead and bare upper body. The world's kindness is inexhaustible. The Yugograd massacre has never happened there. Frantisek the Brave is coming, and the SRV Revolutionary Army is behind him, waving white flags. Teresh could ask for anything from that world, but he dare not even look at what moves directly in front of him. It is no longer part of this world. Only the bass drum's low sound from mono echoes in his black mirrored hearing. There are six of them, hidden among the reeds. It seemed like such a good idea to all of them. Let's go, let's go there, let's make a nest, they exclaim together. Khan lights gas lamps in the dark. The gas has a nasty, slug-like smell. A spark from the match and the lamp ignites with a roar. Blue flames dancing under the glass, casting delicate shadows around the children in the reed field. Khan looks at his handiwork and he likes it. He likes how the shadows flicker on Malin's cheeks. He's not afraid to tell her, and the girl is grateful for it. Tucked into Charlotte's dress, wearing white swimwear, Malin Lind is saturated and overripe. Mentally, she can no longer reinterpret the flood of substances as well-being, but her tissues are still sh shredding. The substance is now beating the girl, brutally and jealously, and nothing in this feverish night indicates that it will subside. It hits her again. Mullen presses her hands to her sides, and her breathing stops for a second. The pleasure of the dress fabric grinds on her lymph nodes, her armpits smooth, her rosy nipples protruding against the spandex, but her nerve endings have long been numb, too numb to notice. The sensory units are scorched, and the physical apparatus can no longer receive pleasure. The bottle of water slips from the girl's hand onto the beach. No one notices. Everyone just keeps chatting around her. A warm reddish glow sticks to Malin's inner thighs. She writhes, her pupils glowing at the same frequency, in burnout mode. And around her, bouquets of lilies, chrysanthemums, and red roses wilt in the sand. The child shakes, and the body collapses under the strain. Please comfort me. It's too good to be, she mumbles. It's too sad to be. The operatic star opens her eyeball whites wide, and remorse, suffocating remorse of glands. What have I done? Me, foolish, foolish woman. Ice cold water gurgles in Nadja's lifeless lung tissues. All that Nadja has done remains in history as a shell, lifeless and distorted. She is a mannequin there, a delusion. Almost nobody remembers who Nadja really was. They haven't even heard of her breakthrough in The Officer's Wife. Her scandalous hit, The Sailor's Mistress, is at best a historical curiosity, a ridiculous exaggeration of her time. She's forgotten, out of date, and what use is a beautiful dress to her? There's nowhere to go. But above the shimmering surface of the water, chandeliers are still being lit. Everything is still ahead. Piccolos, her favorite instruments, and lively fanfare, with their grandois, grandois sound. Thunderous timpani roll. The sound of water rushing in Nadja's ears like a frenzy. Life, ovations, burning, burning tributes. She resurfaces, and people, young and beautiful, are once again there with her. A real party is going on, it seems, to Nadja. The world will probably end soon. No, says Frantisek the Brave. There are still eight years left. What a pleasant young woman. What cheekbones, like a step eagle. Eight years, but then everything will still be is still possible. Yes, everything is possible for this world, says Frantisek the Brave. Annie, the younger sister, carefully gives Malin bottled water to drink like a nurse. Khan pulls back the reeds like curtains. He starts talking. Against the backdrop of the dark, the lapping body of water, two silhouettes away. They dance one wildly, the other in the same rhythm, but three times slower. Annie wraps her burning sister in a cocoon of dress fabric. Charlotte herself hatched out of there a long time ago. It was 40 minutes ago when she had the second one. She comes out of the darkness to Teresh, and op he opens his eyes to her voice. The half-naked girl puts the water bottle, bottle till the boy's mouth and says, Teresh, hey, you need to drink, otherwise you'll get heat stroke too. You'll get heat stroke. You too. She calls up behind her. Don't forget to drink water. 
The boy takes the bottle and gulps it down, his thirst unquenchable. But with the cool, but with the cool water, his desire finally subsides. Blissful chemical peace crushes the boy under its weight. Thumbs of the same color as the waistband of her golden shorts absent-mindedly. Charlotte Lind moves her newly hatched body in front of them, head slightly tilted back and eyes closed. The girl nods along the bouncing rhythm of the bass drum. She smells briefly. It's ringing. Charlotte laughs at her own jokes. This breaks Tadesh down. This and the half he secretly took. He hears the tremor of laughter kicking in there, in the mystery of someone else's cerebral cortex. How would it be to laugh that laugh? It's not about anything. It's not even made up of words anymore. It's long gone. Lost to Teresh. Mahayek, in a school uniform, came down the stairs. How was he supposed to know that only complete outcasts wear school uniforms in Vasa? The guys who scrubbed the walls, he'd only just got here. The eldest Lund went down the stairs, her shoes clicking on the stepping stones, and the girl's 10th grade friend, handsome Alexander's mouth, kept going on beside her. Teresh went after them to the dinner queue like a shadow. Charlotte Lund never goes to the school canteen. She doesn't eat. She doesn't even have a metabolism in this world. But handsome Alexander charmed her. Teresh Mahayek from the 8th stood behind Charlotte and poured himself some moors. The girl turned around and reached for the moors ladle. Teresh handed her the ladle, and so it happened. You're Charlotte Lund, Teresh muttered the girl's semi-mythical name. And you are? Teresh Mahayek, Teresh says Teresh Mahayek, and that was that. Charlotte's auburn hair strokes her shoulders as the girl shakes her head to the rhythm of the music. She raises her hands above her head, fingertips touching in the air, and beneath her collarbones are small bare breasts, taut and tanning light white lines. She laughs. Got it. Teresh Mahayek. And then shakes her head happily from side to side. I got it. Just got it. There in the sand where Teresh Mahayek kneels, the girl peels off some dark blue sock with her foot. And when the girl crouches in front of him, Teresh Mahayek says, I got it too. Warm and cold waves crash above them. Between the two pale thighs, the gold of her panty sparkles, which Teresh looks at, selflessly, with the innocence of a child. Just, you know, it's nice to look at. They collapse on top of each other like houses made of matches, free of desires, just for the sake of playfulness. Alright. <laughs> Give me a second. Yeah. Drink water, she said. Khan, Teresh, and the crazy Sudo rally driver are looking out, with their heads up, as the pail approaches from behind the house. Inside, the bass drum thumps heavily, and outside, behind the silhouette of the building, a backlash grove of alders rolls up to the sky and across the entire visible horizon. Like a wave, the pale rises vertically from the spruce forests and mountain ranges above the world's expanse. It horror, its horror slowly shifts, thundering over the world, but the world is made of matter, and matter is evergreen, ancient. It must maintain its eerie dignity even at the moment of disappearance. Smiling grandly, fondly, as Frantishek the Brave once smiled behind the dumpster. The peaks of the mountains darken silently, clearings expand, and the frosted and their frosted spruce fields sparkle under the stars. I'm not K. Voronikin or anything like that, but Tadesh puffs in the cabin of the car. He rummages on the seat there. Khan stands outside, leaning on the car, taking a snuff from Kenny. But Teresh crawls out of the machine backwards with a bottle of flavored berry wine in his hands, but it seems to me that in half an hour it will all be under the pale, Khan. That's what? What did he say? Nothing, Kenny. I wouldn't listen to him. He's not K. Voronikin or anything. Teresh twists off the cork of the flavored berry wine with a snap and brings the bottle to his mouth. He'd better not say anything more. 
This is an oceanographic, oceanographic, oceanographic myth. The killer wave points little Khan towards the body of the water. All four of them look, safely wrapped in a beach blanket. In the darkness, insects buzz around the gas lanterns. For a long time, it was just that. A myth. A seafarer's tale. Arda even has a mythological name for it. Halderdinger. But now, they're scientifically documented phenomena. They really exist, you know? It explains the tens, hundreds of ships that have disappeared without a trace. They're also called rogue waves, draupner waves, and my favorite, freak waves. They seem to come out of nowhere and are significantly higher than the rest of the waves, so a killer wave can also be relatively small. But for example, when there's a 10 meter wave, they're the highest scientifically measured wave in the world. Oh, I've seen documentary footage of them. Khan shakes his chin, demonstrating exciting incredulity of the footage. The footage was even taken from a Mask Ocean drilling rig. You can't imagine what a monster it is. Khan feels his tongue and mind working in perfect unison. Everything comes out perfectly. His tongue was once incompetent, his mind disjointed, but not now. If only it would remain so forever. He has forgotten his hand in midair. It still shows the awe-inspiring height of a killer wave that forms from a 10-meter wave. Melin watches it hanging in the sky. A sudden surge of interest saves her from the grip of her own body. She now knows what she needs. She needs to take more, just a little bit, and then everything will start again, but stronger. The girl's mouth opens slightly. She eagerly gulps on water from the bottle. The water sparkles on her lips. Where do they come from? It's maths, right? Jesper sits with his hands on his cheek. Some sort of mathematical formula explains it, right? Exactly, answers Khan. Nonlinear effect. I'm not even going to pretend I know what it is, but anyway, it just turns out. It turns out that a killer wave can form from any number of smaller waves based on certain formula. If they move on a large body of water, like the ocean, there's a chance that at some point, an almost vertical, extremely unstable monster wave will be born from them. It sucks in the movement energy of the other waves, the water becomes calmer around it. Regular waves turn into ripples, and the killer wave collapses under its abnormal weight. But before that, it can, I don't know, sow enormous destruction, if you'll allow me. Khan finishes with a grand gesture. And you know where they occur most frequently in the world? Here. The phenomenon is called the North Sea Autumn Wave. Holy shit! And he bursts out laughing, her foul mouth showing. The girl's pupils have long since turned black with... My di my dryasis. My dryasis. Midriasis. Let's go with that. He looks out at the water through the reeds where, to little Annie's mind, totally screwed up killer wave a totally screwed up killer wave could be rising, could rise at any moment. But then Teresh comes with Charlotte. And you know what's most screwed up about it? Khan asks slyly. He wipes his glasses and then puts them back on. His almond shaped eyes are squinting in the magnifying glass. Up to the point of pop science mystery. The same effect. Don't ask me how. I don't know. But the same nonlinear effect explains the pale. They use it in entrepreneurs. This is how the pale behaves when it sweeps over the world. Like carriage wheels, says Charlotte, looking at the boys into the boys' eyes. You've got it, by the way. Khan, if I may say? Yes, you may say nods young Inayet. You're extremely smart for your age. Charlotte's voice is genuinely sincere. Khan feels crowned by her compliment. And you have a very, very good posture, he replies as she laughs heartily. A crossfire of respect and affection roars like an ocean. Everything wavers and flickers like a flame. And in the middle of it, Annie suddenly raises her head. Nimble like an otter, she moves neck craned, as if searching for something. Wait, wait, she says. Is there no more water? Jesper doesn't notice how Annie's gaze hints at him, how everyone waits for him. He is still staring out at the sea, enchanted, his white sailor's hat on his head. He doesn't feel anything special. He's relatively sober, just hot. It's all slightly, it's all a slight disappointment for Jesper. Didn't even get to make out, but killer waves, not too shabby. A man in a wetsuit gasps for breath as he surfaces. He spits out the icy water from his mouth and rolls onto his stomach on the surfboard. A solitary black dot named Jesper bobs half a kilometer from the shore at the mercy of the waves. 
he checks the stopwatch on his wrist. Another 15 minutes and he will reach his crucial, his critical body temperature. He needs to rest. Jesper tries to relax, his muscles trembling from lactic acid. He looks behind him, where the strip of pine trees marking Charlottesjall is visible, and above the giant clouds in the fading sky slowly converge. The board rises and falls with the rhythm of the water and his breath. Everything suddenly becomes so quiet. Where have all my waves gone? Still and always those five famous, terrible last words. Why did you leave me here? I'll stick to myself. I'll cry to every god like a wave. Will you stay this time? Will you stay this time? Will you stay this time, or what? A terrible roar is approaching. Jesper stands up on the surfboard, pulls the rubber mask to the back of his head, and looks with a blonde strand of hair on his face. Against the backdrop of the tiny point of his surfboard, a huge wave rises, a dark gray frothy wall, like a cell membrane. It rises vertically, the crest of foam obscuring the sky from Jesper's view, and droplets flying. The swelling cliff of the wave lifts the surfboard on its foam. The famous interior designer paddles with all his might on it. He tries to turn himself and go with the wave. But Halderdinger moves at an enormous speed. Too bad, sighs Annie generously. You deserve to feel good too. They stand on the asphalt road under a street lamp, and from where the asphalt crumbles into the sand, the large Charlotte Shell beach begins. 45 minutes of darkness, of forest darkness and eager chatter are behind them. It was so nice to talk. Just the two of them. Jesper holds a dark red water pump and pumps it. The water sings as the container fills. Well, I don't feel bad. It's nice to talk to you. And the others look very happy too. And there's something there, I guess. But Khan talks like he's got some heavenly peace. And Malin? Malin is grilling, interrupts Annie. Right. That's probably the right word. Jesper puts a cork on the two water bottles. After putting them in his pocket, he looks at Annie questioningly. Bugs are desperately throwing themselves at the streetlight, and the girl's bare feet are rubbing together underneath it. She holds a gas lantern in her hand. The electric light makes the fine hairs on her bare legs shine. Jesper is prompted to ask that by that smile, like an idea spreading across Annie's face. I know, she says. You're more like the nose boy like a nose boy anyway, with all your talk about perfumes. Jesper squats in front of the girl on the asphalt, and a single tablet sparkles in the mirror of her wallet. We're gonna need a mortar, some hard stuff, the girl says. When Jesper returns excitedly with his stone, she's already had has an eyeshadow palette in her hand. Thank you so much anyway. And he carefully breaks the pill's powdery surface with a mirror and grinds the pieces into soft raspberry colored powder. She licks the edge of the container with her tongue and then cautiously takes out a five real bill from her wallet. Jesper watches this ritual with fascination. He watches as Annie folds the black banknote in the middle and uses it to separate the powder into lines on the mirror. There they run, parallel like rails. The five real bill rolls into a small tube between the girl's fingers. Now you close one nostril, like this, with your finger and put the other one in. She demonstrates the little tube to, dem to Jesper. And then, Take a deep breath and snort the entire line into your nose. Let me show you. Annie Ellen Lund is kneeling in front of a water pump under a street lamp. The asphalt sparkles and the petite girl bends over the mirror. Jesper, dressed in a white sailor suit, watches as she snorts the line into her nostril with determination. The entire powder disappears into the paper roll in one quick moment. It all seems absolutely magical to Jesper. Annie shakes her head, moaning, and hands him the banknote. It stings a little, but it feels good. It kicks in faster too, but it lasts less. Do it. And Jesper does it. The drug powder rushes through the black tube in the banknote and curves. The crystals crush capillaries, and his nostrils itch and tingle. 
And then, when Jesper stands up, everything is so quiet and beautiful. They go down to the forest together, the gas lamp rustling in Annie's hand and casting long, moving shadows on the tree trunks in the dark of the dunes. Jesper pushes himself from his stomach onto the board with fluid motion. The sound of water is roaring behind him, and the interior designer kicks the board keel with his heel. In one moment, the obstacle becomes minimal. Everything is perfect, and he glides through the water. The board no longer touches the water. It hovers on a vibrating air cushion. Zigzagging, Jesper surfs down and up the steep slope, back to the crest of the wave. Behind him, he can hear the wave breaking, collapsing under its own weight. A huge, shimmering curtain of water falls and pulls him inside. Jesper allows it, falls behind, and enters the dimness of the tube, where the world, which exists only for a short period of time, achieves stability in its collapse. The wave collapse is a permanent environment, a murky almond-shaped cavity in the raging whirlpool of water. Inside, it is, a, it is smooth and quiet. If only this could last forever, it would be the summer of 52. The summer of 52 is an object collapsing forever, eating him alive. Something is terribly wrong with this cluster of memories, terribly wrong. It seems impossible to go on. The world does not support him. But here, for 10 seconds, everything stabilizes, and Jesper strokes the wall of the water and his mouth. From the red, from the cold, always say, Please. In the courtyard where the wheels of the car have drawn a loop in the snow, Inayat Khan looks back with his head up on the f and the farmhouse hovers over him like a ghost. The entrails of electric wires hanging out of the rotating object, black against the expanse of the starry sky. He drifts towards the pale with a self-evident calmness. High above, the trail of furniture and fallen foundation remains behind him, in front of him in the courtyard. Khan sees Taresh and Kenny stumbling after the object, heads down, until they reach the wooden fence. In a strange panic-free worry, they all look towards Ulv's shack. It seems any slight creak f comes from there, from its limestone foundation. It's about to rise, but nothing happens. The pail freezes in place far away behind the house. The sound of the forest subsides, and the music inside the farmhouse falls silent. Somewhere in the perceived distance, on the frozen edge of the pail, the farmhouse falls apart and disappears. Ulves, sweating profusely, comes to the door and lights a menthol cigarette. He's taken off his sweatshirt. The young man stands there, framed by the doorway, in his sweatpants and silver tank top, exhaling steam and sweat droplets flying off him. Then Teresh and Khan hurry towards him. The man suddenly looks back and startles. Take it, Ulf shouts, running towards them with envelopes in his hand. He waves his hand in an approximate direction towards the pail and hands the papers to Khan. You have to go, now! The sound of the engine starting can be heard and the wheels of the car spin in the snow. The massive structure can no longer bear its phantom weight. It breaks. The expanse of logging area sinks beneath it in a moment, exploding in powder snow. And a landslide as a shockwave passes over the world. Spruces bent under the impact. The pail slams open the windows of the old dilapidated manor house. It curves around the edges of the house, as if hesitating for a moment, then collapses around it. The pail engulfs the manor in its bosom, and somewhere inside, in a low-ceilinged hall, a young man puts on his headphones. He reads the sweeping pail like a magnetic tape in a stereo 8. The only sign of life in the lifeless tableau of the Lund children is the eerie, impossible memory of someone named Jesper. The pail sweeps over the fields on either side of the village road. Its avalanche crashes into the gravel, a bubbling wall approaching turning raspberry red in the glow of the motor car's tail lights. The chain wheels squeal on the gravel. Meany, 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 screams the crazy rally driver. Ah, go, 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 go. Not onomatopoeia. 
<laughs> to the machine as if commanding a horse. He's already He already has his foot heavily on the gas pedal, as if the cart would go faster from it. And looking at the speedometer, it seems that it does. Tadesh watches the arrow in the yellowish light of the speedometer, which jumps to 200. Khan next to him sees the pail. It moves slowly, but surely over the windows. The interior electric lighting dims because of it. The man's glass gets foggy. Glasses get foggy. He has sunk deep into the leather seat from the speed and presses two envelopes against his heart. His eyes become moist with joy from behind his foggy glasses, but Teresh cannot hear him over the loud engine roar. I was right, Teresh. I was always right, he says. But Teresh doesn't hear him. The engine is too loud. Jesper and Annie are coming through the tall grass with a gas lantern. Jesper is holding both the lantern and water bottle, while Annie is only holding her shirt. In the glow of the flickering flame, Jesper is examining the birthmark on her back. Only the thin straps of Annie's bra still hide them. As the rustling grass brushes against their legs, Jesper enjoys the sensation on his bare skin. Thirsty, he takes a sip from wa of water from the bottle and exclaims, This is divine, divine water. They should bottle it up and sell it. Joyful shouts from the beach greet them as they approach. Everyone embraces each other. Annie wipes the lipstick off from Jesper's lips, from Jesper's lips under the light of the gas lantern and laughs. Khan is riding piggyback on Teresh, pretending that Teresh is a robot. He turns his friend's head, making robot noises and guiding him wherever he wants. Then, when robot Teresh has been led knee-deep into the water, Khan drops down. He lingers for a moment, admiring the jellyfish, but the others have already started running towards the water in their swimsuits. The little glowing bodies disappear into the darkness of the water. The sand shifts beneath their bare feet, while the soft water washes around their ankles. Their hypersensitive bodies react to every touch. Sand explosions burst between Annie's toes, making, them, making her curl them in pleasure and step forward cautiously. They all move slowly, their hands hovering over the cool surface of the water. They shriek occasionally, sparing every moment of their stinking ecstasy. And the salve itself receives them, flowing around their hips and bellies. It's cool and perfectly viscous. Melin can't take it. When the water moistens her breasts and armpits, the girls sink entirely into it. Only the hymn of surrender remain on the surface of the sea. She digs her nails into her palms, feeling how they snap immediately. It doesn't fit inside her. Hormones are already distorting her sliding body. The pelvic basin has expanded into a birth canal, and unbearable well-being throbs deep into her hips. In the grave of her body fluids, a tiny homunculus closes its needle-sized eyes. The creature curled up in a half-circle opens its mouth to scream. But nothing is heard. Not a single sound. It has never been here. Malin relaxes. Everything is impossibly good. Everything blackens and echoes there, in the depth of the water. Charlotte's glowing white shadow slides past her. She feels someone's soft hands on her shoulders. It's Khan. He lifts the girl to the surface. Malin inhales salty air and remains floating there. Water drips from her hair, and above, in the black sky, stars shimmer infinitely, detailed with milk splashes. All six of them bow their heads and sway like that, in a semicircle. And in the black mirror of the water, the stars shine back at them. They shimmer weakly, widely. Only Inayat Khan's glasses reflect all their brilliant sharpness. They're not there anymore. Khan hears the voice weakening in his hands. He looks down. The stars slip off his glasses. In the place of the stars, Melin Lin's eyes shift and the darkness of her open mouth moves in every word. But I still see them. And then, when they woke up in the reeds in the morning, like kittens in a nest, they picked up the garbage properly. They put up the clothes. They put on the clothes that had dried in the sun. It's dazzling bright light. Their eyes hurt and the world around them seemed friendly yet strange. Everything has been said yesterday, in the darkness of the night. There was no need to repeat it in the daylight. They awkwardly smiled and exchanged tired bits of conversation as they walked to the train tram stop. There, they agreed to meet in the last week of August, when the girls would be back from their family trip to Grad. They couldn't specify the exact day. They would call and send postcards. At the end of August meeting, they planned to discuss what the change situation at school would look like, and generally about the real world. 
They didn't kiss or anything like that at the stop. However, there were many looks loaded with farewell regret and physical secret messages exchanged. The girls got on the tram and the boys went to Teresh's father's summer cottage. That was the last time they saw each other. Good job, good job. Oh my god. That was a long chapter. That one was insane. <sighs> ah. Youth. Them youth. Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, that was that was I I did get a warning that there was gonna be a heavy chapter thirteen, so I, I was mentally prepared, but like yeah, that was a like yeah. That was a significant chunk of the actual book. It was very, very substantial. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to talk about beforehand the part where I was like, oh, yeah. And it's also worth noting as we were recapping that um, the way the memories of the characters is brought up, like if we're going to go with like disco stats, right? There is one for the boys and it's called puberty, right? And every time we go back to the memory of the girls, it is like the horniest incessant every three seconds. We got to look at their legs, back breasts, whatever, like just the puberty voice will not stop kicking in in a way. Right. And it's particular because it only sounds this way in the memory chapters the rest of the book isn't that horny at all it's only when they're in that specific like memory space that it's going that crazy um and like it was notable because of how much it changed and how much the tone came up in contrast with the rest of the chapters in the past Mm. um so you're like okay yeah these arrested development characters not the show, but literally the usage of the term are stuck here in the prime of their like, you know, most, I guess, biggest, happiest moments. Yeah, and very eventful. Very eventful and everything formative about them was like frozen in this place, you know? Um, so like you're, you're catching this, this, this stat that's maxed out for them. That is like fucking just, everything uh, uh, um, that happens to you when you, when you hit 13. Uh, What I was not expecting, however, is this insanely long and detailed meditation on that in just the form of kids ODing on the beach. Like in terms of all the segments of this book and everything that's happened so far for some particular reason, this is the most significant one because of how much time we've spent here, right? Going out to meet the self-chiller and getting uh, anything we can from him because he's able to communicate with the dead is, you know, and, and driving through the pale to do that is a, is a detailed, like, action scene, you know, mm-hmm. of, of, a, of a picture being painted where they're willing to risk everything to go past armies and people fleeing the other way to go get that information in the present. But like to spend that much time fixated on like, again, the past and the bodies of the girls and the drugs and the way it hits and everything they're going through. And that like pretty fucked up again, like kids ODing and snorting and you know, that whole journey and everything that's there is like, There's a reason why that much emphasis is being put on that stuff. And like, if that's not the entire purpose of the book in the form of this insanely long chapter, heavily focused on this, then I don't know what else it could be. Right. Like it was very uncomfortable (laughs) to like be thrust heavily into, uh, into the perspective of you know prepubescent kids having these like experiences you know not just sexually but also like drug addled 
you know, and describing like a girl going through a, again, overdose orgasm, more or less. It's like, it's like, this is the point of obsession with these characters. And like, it has to be the most important thing because we've spent so much time on it, you know? I don't, and, and I guess we, we, uh, have to see like what this spells out but i mean yeah immensely heavy meditation on that aspect of it um to the point of being uncomfortable mm. um kids this kids in discovery you know yeah this is a very intense moment for them for yeah all of them. and and you can you can yeah to be remembered like forever, you know, like, oh, what is a important memory from your childhood that would definitely leave an impression, you know, especially since the boys, they're like looking for that contact constantly, constantly. And then like, they kind of go through with it and then it probably stays with them until the rest of their lives. Yep. There's not much happening there. You know, they're, they're completely fucked. They can never leave that moment behind. It's all that, right. That's the formative core memory. It literally says it everything com com comes back to this point, you know, um, and, and they're never able to let that go. Their entire ability to become functioning adults mm -hmm. stops right here. Um, it, it's just a, a question of like, again, time slows down, you know, going through that chapter. Like it was, it was like getting agonizing with it. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, isn't it how drug trips happen? I guess so. I guess that's the point, right? If you do a mushroom trip or an ecstasy trip, you're in it to win it. <laughs> you're in it for a bit, and time will last. It seems like forever. Yeah. And then you come out of there, and that forever is still a huge chunk. You know, it's yeah, it has a big weight. I mean, you can like, and how do they move on knowing? what we know happens to the girls and they grow up and they still have this mystery of what happened to them. This person with who we share the moment in our formative years, you know? Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to affect them in different ways. Mm -hmm. I feel like the usage of words is like, you know, Kervitz clearly has a skill for that and is able to like as detailed as he wants to, spell everything out or if he wants to ever so briefly just go and then he killed them and then he died and that was it it literally throws a blah 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 out in describing that part of it you know um and you know there's something like oh fuck about this the abruptness of it there's a very like you know like the most important details are in the the yada yada yadas almost in some cases um but yeah i i, I think like I think all of the things that we realized about that chapter could have been told in and, and emphasized in, in brevity if desired. So like why the, the meditation, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm left wondering at this point. So, um, yeah. And, and again, just like, <sighs> <laughs> like definitely just massively uncomfortable with it while it's like it's it's the complexity of like be going through that teenage memory being stuck in that time from their perspective but also you as an adult being in the cockpit for this memory is like okay like oof, you know yeah. um and this is also again a world where we're just fucking like you're like well clearly no one like K holes to death or anything, but like, um, yeah, yeah, just you know, let's 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 like if you have your kunos and kuno s's of the world, you know, like maybe you're not like the shit kids, but you're kind of the norm, you know, in this type of setting. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that this is this is pro the most important thing uh, to, to these characters. And that's, that's why we just went to church and back in that chapter. Uh, I'm going to need a, a goddamn minute 
to fucking process everything, use the bathroom and, and drink and, and take a step. So, uh, be right back. All right. Coming back. Okay. Yeah. Just, uh, took a little walk and grabbed some refill. And yeah, and I think in just summarizing my, my thoughts to Punch Mom briefly just now, I was like, I think it's just like from top to bottom, there's been like three different lenses that we've been looking at, like child sexualization in the book so far, you know, at, up up top through like the lens of like an evil, literal fucking yeah, murderer. murderer. And then second through the lens of the stunted main character and now through the lens of like actually traveling back in time. So I'm just like, that's a whole lot of that <laughs> as a, as a, as a, as a subtext going yeah. on, you know, um, more than, more than expected. I'm, uh, I'm curious to see if, uh, there will be further instances of such and if there'll be anything, uh, that Kurvitz has to say about it since it's such a recurring concept from different lenses, mm. you know, looking, it's heavy, but, uh, looking to know on what logic does all this information come to us? Yeah, it's, it's heavy, but it's like, you don't have to, you don't have to stare away from the heavy, but, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what you have to say about it. You know, with that, let's take it to the next chapter. Chapter 14. List of Absentees. Twenty years later, near Vasa, a crowd of refugees stands in a traffic jam. The 60 million square kilometers of the land mass of the Calta Isola has just lost 6% of its total area. A lit up billboard above the motor carriage announces all lines for entry. The red river of taillights shimmers in the autumn night and somewhere in the middle of it, in a giant traffic tram, stands the machine in which Teresh Mahayek has been long sleeping. Steam rises from under the hood, and the radial splatters of mud curve around the car's body. The nickel tips of motor components gleam from under the black plates of the casing. Even Anayat Khan has curled up in the cabin, but he's not yet asleep. He savors every passing moment precisely because he's dead tired. The seat's leather creaks under his weight, and the sounds of news-gathering airships can be heard in the sweet slumber. The rotors beat safely in the distance, and the dark vortex of sleep invites and swirls. Khan moves in and out of consciousness as he pleases. Sometimes the machine jolts and moves a few meters. Then he opens his eyes from his daze and sees Kenny passing by. The crazy pseudo rail rally driver talks to other drivers and scrapes frost from the windshield. At this moment, Khan knows that he will miss it all. He already misses it. The headlights diamonds, the taillights bloody glow in the exhaust fumes, the knowledge that everything will be all right. It was 20 years ago that he last felt this, like this, full of possibilities. Back when they were waiting for the girls to return from Grad. Outside in the world, behind his pinned shut eyelids, the kingdom of God begins. He pressed his hand to his chest and embraces his invisible partner. All those spaces, the expanses out there in the boggy fields and the roadside are possibilities. Opportunities for gatherings, conversations branch out, as they always do, in the darkness of Khan's mind's office. Malin Lund walks there with him, nodding, listening, and asking questions. Laughing at his jokes for the 20th year, they sit down on the side of the highway. She doesn't mind. The girl's body is untouched by time. She still looks like a child, but her spirit has moved on with Khan. Grown up, become an adult. She's poised now, mysterious and sad. Two months went by, but the meeting at the end of August never happened. Even though the girls returned to Vasa on the 15th of August, they never called. Why this was, and why they went to Charlotte Jal Beach three times in that period remains a mystery. The afternoon sun painted the curtain stripes on the walls. In the big room of Teresa's father's cottage, 
The air was still. Something was rising, stifling his breathing. The vacuum. It was a sense of loss. A terrible, terrible worry. After weeks of waiting by the phone, they finally decided to call the girls themselves. The three of them were standing in a large room. Teresh put the phone down. Khan beside him was impervious. What happened? They weren't at home or... The mother picked up. Teresh slumped back in the armchair. She said they're at the beach. Where at the beach? In Charlottesville. What? So why didn't they call? I don't know. Something's wrong. And that's when the argument happened. The one Teresh fought Jesper for two days later. He wanted to run down to the beach. Khan had already tied his shoelaces, but only Jesper still thought this wasn't cool enough. This way wasn't cool enough. They should wait, let them call first. And so it was. And 15 minutes later, at one o'clock, Agnetha, the ice cream saleswoman, was the last living person to see the Lund children. It was 28th of it was the 28th of August, International Day of the Missing. Since that day, they weren't cool anymore. He tries not to use the word. It sounds like an accusation. Drenched and gasping for air, their interior designer sinks back into the sand. Hyperthermia. It smells like rotting reeds. Rushes and grass lie beneath the ground in the breeze. He's 34 years old. He hits the wet sand with his heels. How and why he endured, he does not know. His joints were cramped from the cold. Why didn't he roll himself off the board into the sea? Or when the wave crashed on itself, why didn't he stay? Above, in the dark of an autumn night, masses of clouds sink into each other. Slowly, he grabs the top of his head with both hands and squeezes. The mouth, blue with cold, opens slowly. The airway shudder and the stomach ripples in contractions. His heels dig into the sand and his fists twitch, but nothing changes. He remembers everything. A 52nd year stand still inside his skull. A haunting, impossible museum exhibit. A replica of a lost world. The smell is ever sweeter and always the same. An irrefutable fact whose seriousness cannot be overstated. There is no going back. In his dream, he hears the sound of hooves approaching. They're coming on the black asphalt. Jesper, Khan wants to call him and tell him to get ready. This is the real deal, but there's no phone booth here. And in the kingdom of heaven, it's dark. And mounted police are checking the rows between the machines. A nightmare silhouette stops behind the window glass. Khan opens up his eyes. Steam rises from the horse's nostrils as, as it snorts, its wet black gleaming, its wet black eyes gleaming in half sleep against the man. An officer on horseback directs a beam of light through the frosty window glass into the cabin and moves on. The sound of iron echoes on the echoes on the asphalt. The horse recedes, and Khan closes his eyes and falls asleep again. His hands are frozen in an embrace on his chest. When they finally fell asleep. Khan heard a terrible voice in his sleep. It was on the night of the 28th of August, the same day, and with that voice, terror descended upon the land. At first, he heard it in his dream, how it moved closer and closer and cried out at regular intervals. Maj, Annie, Malin, Charlotte. The boy woke up in the second floor bedroom. He looked into Teresh's eyes wide with fear his friend standing over him and shaking him. Khan was fully awake now, but the world's most feared list of absentees was still being shouted. It continued outside, in Charlottesville, not in his dream, but in the real world. The blood clotted in Khan's veins. Can you hear it too? Yes, Teresh re replied. They woke Jes Jesper up. They put on their jackets and ran outside. It was cold, and for the rest of the time this year, and for the first time this year, the smell of autumn floated in the air. They stopped in the garden and listened. The names echoed in the woods with the barking of the dogs. They ran through the apple orchard, past the gooseberry bushes, into the darkness of the pines. Flash nights, flashlights and flares flickered there. They were search parties. 
By the end of the fourth day, the volunteers were dispersed. Hundreds of people had come in help to help some way, to come to help in some way, to share the concern. Thousands of calls came in to the special hotline. Appeals were made and programs were initiated. The press and radio jumped into action. And the next morning, the girls' pictures were on the front pages. Headlines used the most horrendous sentimentality. Mother in distress, children, please come home. Opinion columns discussed the possibility of restoring the death penalty as paranoia mixed with the desire for revenge. Who abducted the children from their mother? This outpouring of compassion in which the boy's own loss was completely lost. All the wailing and gnashing of teeth, they felt powerless in the midst of it. It humiliated them. At first it was just a hunch. Now Jesper can put his indignation into words, a tantalizing curiosity. Somewhere underneath all that frothing, the salacious bourgeois saw, with his own sweet horror, all the things that were done to the girls. Behind the blinds, where Per Jonas dared not look directly, he peeped through a newspaper article. He saw himself. There, he was the man. He was eating a meat pie in oil batter and liked what he saw. But then, as the preteen Jesper looked at his classmates, it was an indescribable mystery, an alien realm of bodies. The arch of the back, an exposed arm, the smallest bit was enough. To this day, he hates adult sexuality. For him, it is a debauched fastidiousness. Realistically and paradoxically, it makes him a pedophile. Just as the epitome of good taste enters the lobby of Havslanglar in a west in a wetsuit, the receptionist puts the phone down. The renowned interior designer arrives in the middle of the night, dripping, leaving sandy footprints on the carpet. The gentleman looks so froze, so miserable, frozen half to death, that the woman forgets the phone call and rushes to wrap him in a towel. No, I don't need an ambulance. Jesper waves his hand and grits his teeth. I don't want tea. Don't want tea. I don't want the black currant tea either. He calls for the elevator and presses the button with a numb, frozen finger, even though it's long since on fire. No, I don't want to. I'm going for a bath. A hot bath. Monsieur de la Gardie. The woman remembers at the last moment. She sticks a shoe between the closing elevator doors. You had a phone call. Someone called Ollie. At night? What about? A newspaper ad. Volunteers were sent home, and, after search parties, so went the rest. The pine forests remained quiet in autumn. The boys lumbered through them. The bloodhounds barked no more, and no border patrol boats wandered at the bay. And everywhere they went, it was as if the void itself, its spirit, had been released. Everything hung still, useless. The clanging, ca the changing cabins, the sparse half-empty beach. At the tram stops, the trams rolled empty, then half-empty again, the doors slamming shut and opening. The last to go were the ill-fated divers, three weeks later. And so they saw the long surrender begin all around them. What it meant, they knew well. Very, they knew very well, though they never dared to say the word to each other. Together, they thought up the most fantastic plans, thrilling triumphs, comebacks together. The school year had officially begun a month ago, and it was the parents' joint decision to send them back to school. There, waiting for them were photos of the girls, flowers and storm lanterns on the stairs. In the school corridor too, the fake sorrow waved. Everyone had somehow known them. Everyone fought it for attention and compared their losses. There too, they disappeared. They didn't, tell any, te they didn't dare tell anyone what happened over the summer. Finally, they poured their hearts out to the female officer when she was at school. And as a result, Sigismund Berg, the boy who by then was a well-known figure to the youth police was among more than 200 people interrogated. The treachery bore no fruit when the female officer went to talk to the headmaster at the end of November. The three of them broke out of class. The corridor echoed with the sound of their shoes. She was the only link to the investigation. That heartless instance. They stopped her at the door and begged until the poor woman had no choice. 
We have to get used to the idea that the girls are dead, she said. Pictures and storm lanterns were collected from the school stairs. The death penalty was not reintroduced. Even Vidkatud was sentenced to life. A year after the disappearance, he was arrested on suspicion of similar crimes and then rushed, press rushed to link it all to the lynched children. The old master himself dropped hints to that effect about puppies who wandered too far from their mother and other such heraldic references. When the three of them got together, that was all they could talk about. That or some other topic the media had fed them. If not the herd or the recently list the re or recently released list of sex offenders, then the letter sent to Carl and Anne Margaret Lund two years after their disappearance, the details of the handwriting analysis, or, for example, the psychic who claimed that the girls' bodies were buried under the foundations of the Ringhal Ice Hockey Stadium. As the articles became less frequent, the meetings became so hopeless that each of the boys just tried to avoid them in his own way. Jesper secretly went surfing and played sports. In 10th grade, Khan failed for the first time and dropped out of school. At the beginning of the 11th, Teresh went back to Grad. The media had lost all interest in the Lund girls 15 years later. The investigation had long since been stalled, and the lead inspectors had retired. There was no reason to meet again. They retreated to their personal lives. Jesper found himself an underage lingerie model and pretended to not recognize Khan, who was sitting behind the restaurant table wearing a bright blue tie. Teresh visited Charlottesville alone every year. He didn't call to anyone else. He didn't call anyone else. And Khan completely sunk into the world of disappearance cases, sitting in his mother's basement, toggling on the lights of an airship that had long, that had gone missing a century and a half ago, endlessly. Get used to your own fucking thoughts. The end of the world. The dark arches of the mast stations loom over the city entrance. Barriers rise. Custom officers, vests, and stripes glow lemon yellow on the barriers. The motor carriage starts, and everything moves evenly and smoothly. In the leather seat scented rustle of the radio, they talk about an atomic weapon that was dropped on Ravishal three hours ago. Khan feels a warm, and female announcer's voice is calm and beautiful. The rows of streetlights rise above the road, crowned with frost. They glide under the dark blue sky of the morning. He drifts among, along with them to his hometown, where he will leave tomorrow night. One task remains. The lanterns fade. Khan watches as the ghosts of the buildings come out into the light of dawn. The bedroom smells of lilies. Outside, beyond the window of the country house, the bare chestnut trees sway their bony branches in the breeze. She wakes up early in the morning and leaves her husband, who's wearing an eye mask, sleeping in bed. She's 52 years old, with fine facial features and laugh lines that look like tired chicken feet. Her dark green eyes under her eyelids give no hint. She goes downstairs in her morning gown, holding onto the wooden handrail, and makes herself coffee. In the cool room of the wooden house, the lights are out in, spacious, in the spacious kitchen. She likes these blue hours when the house is quiet so you can hear the field mice scratching under the floor. Her delicate, sharp fingers push down on the button on the French press. Even the smell of mold rising from the floorboards has come to please her over time, although it scared her so much at first, 17 years ago when she came to live here. And the silence. Everything is so quiet in the countryside, but over time, even the absence of noise became a kind of blessing. She crosses the large room over the cold floorboards, and around it, the furniture shines in the dim light. The elegance of the fifties, the color peeling from the wood. Next to the door, she pulls her husband's coat over her shoulders and steps into his shoes. Like this, with her gray hair swept up in a simple manner, she comes out onto the porch. The autumn chilly air makes the coffee cup steam in the woman's hand. She pauses for a moment, takes a breath, and then takes a seat at the wooden garden furniture she chose herself. And then, with her leg over her knee, Anne Margaret Lund smokes her first cigarette of the day. She watches the light, the sun rising through the morning mist. In the well-tendered garden in front of her, 
Details emerge from the mist. The glass of the greenhouse gleams, and the lawn needs tidying. This will be her first duty of the day. She extinguishes her cigarette in an upside-down flower pot ashtray and heads back inside. Children of beautiful parents are beautiful. Children of ugly parents are ugly. In the shower downstairs, and Margaret moisturizes her still beautiful body. It wasn't always like this. At first, she was thin and bony like a scarecrow. She was still a tomboy then, climbing over planks and up trees with the boys. Then the female sex hormones kicked in and wove a new body around her, an object of admiration of adipose tissues and curves. Slowly she mastered its subtleties, graduated, taught, fell in love, and gave birth to three daughters, three years in a row, one every year. They left her like beads on a string, and the body recovered, young as she was. It made her girlfriends envious, the way she slept in her husband's arms, unashamed. But later, when she joined the party, another came, the youngest. The man loved her, and so he was not dismayed when her last one permanently disfigured her. But while the force of gravity prevailed in its domain, reason rose high in the ministry, in the office. But now, Anne Margaret Lund stands in front of her, the mirror, and although her skin has lost some of its elasticity and color, her hips are narrow and her thighs slim once again. Everything has tightened up again, but this time she feels a sense of unease rather than relief in her body. Even though she, the feeling of absence, silence, peace, and the smell of mold in her new hideaway overcame her, it secretly became part of her. She is emptiness, but then, when she faces it, and Margaret still feels afraid. As if all this womanhood has somehow disappeared, she tries not to think about it, quickly dries herself off, and covers in beige day clothes, and goes. The woman is raking dried leaves in the garden. When she came to school at the end of the first term, the boys watched her in secret. It was the first term without them, and Anne Margaret came to empty her daughter's lockers. A circle of respect surrounded her. The children moved away. Only Teresh, Jesper, and little Inayet watched from around the corner as she loaded her daughter's trinkets from the previous year into cardboard boxes. She rolled up the pop star's poster, and golden stars fell from her hand. None of the boys told each other why they had come to spy, but secretly they wanted pats from her, to go home with her, to see the girls' rooms, and to make plans to find them. It was a childish longing. They wanted to be important in these matters, and if anyone had the power to sanctify them as such, it was the girl's beautiful mother. It didn't happen, but later they all came anyway, one by one, though they kept it a secret from each other. They scouted out the location of her country home and awkwardly expressed sympathy for the woman. They then exchanged news, too, about the investigation, and slowly Anne Margaret remembered their names. Although the last time this happened was eight years ago, when Teresh and Khan confessed, Jesper lied that he had done nothing of the sort. It's a shame, he said sarcastically. Anne Margaret comes back from the bare gooseberry bushes, puts her gardening gloves on the nail, on a nail in the shed and sends her husband to work. Carl Lund still toils away like a passionate industrial magnet. Even though political instability and the resulting international economic crisis are devastating his business, never mind that he actually has enough money to retire to whatever he wants, wherever he wants. Even Stella Mary. The chauffeur picks him up at half past 11, the luxury car wrapped in gray haze on the village road. In the yard, Anne Margaret watches the raspberry red of the taillights fade as the man moves away from her. Although her husband and the morning Although her husband and the morning ritual, all signs that she once had before blonde, green-eyed daughters recede. One had auburn hair and the other's rainbow eyes, but when she plays the music softly and moves her shoulders to the rhythm, she can't tell which. Then, as the, as the guilt dissolves and the daylight comes in through the white lace curtains, Anne Margaret Lund feels light. She floats as if her whole life had been unlived and all the impressions, small dents that a person leaves in the world had been tapped out to the rhythm of the music. She moves modestly in the shade of her family tree from which all the leaves have fallen. She no longer knows that the way she places her upper lip on her lower lip 
forgetting herself and laughing along with the music is exactly how Charlotte did it. She sweeps the floors, straightens out the table's cloths, and makes the rows of books on the shelf even. She doesn't even listen to the radio. It means nothing to her. As far as Anne-Margaret is concerned, the world ended a long time ago and left her there to do her domestic chores. She sits at the kitchen table, hands in her lap, and watches as the house sparkles. It's half past four. The rooms are quiet and clean. She dozes off occasionally like a cat, her graying head mold nodding at the table. It happened overnight, like Dolores Day, 20 years ago, on the morning of August 29th. She woke up and turned her silver and turned silver. She hears music in her dreams, light pouring onto her hair through the kitchen window, and that surge of light. In that surge of light, it seems like it seems golden again for a moment. There's a knock on the door. Maybe Carl left something behind, or is it coming or is coming home early? But then why knock? It just seems unlikely that someone would come visit her. Almost no one comes here anymore, and she likes it that way. Anne Margaret Lund adjusts her costume, smooths out the wrinkled skirt on her lap, puts on a smile, and opens the door. Hello, madam. Three men are standing there, awkward smiles on their faces. One is wearing very expensive clothes and smells of a 500 real aftershave, unable to hide the fever that makes his forehead flush. Another is standing next to him in a dark orange filmy robe wearing a scarf with an Ilmata tricolor, and the third, tall and dashing, is hurrying to put out his cigarette. Though the connections are hard to make, she invites the men in and watches them standing there in their coats. It is only when he sees, it is only when he sees the boyish timidity with which they stagger from one foot to the other and draw shapes on the floor with their shoe tips that she remembers who they are. It reminds her of the behavior of a young admirer. We've got news, says Anayat Khan. I know, no need to get your hopes up, okay? But it's good news, madam. As the madam leads them into the kitchen, her heart feels pewter heavy again, and her hair gleams in the dim half-light of the kitchen. Coffee? Tea? Five hours ago, Jesper was sitting in the cafe Cinema, in the bright midday light, he feels slightly less projected onto the space between the glass walls and the cube furniture than usual. His head and eyelids are strangely heavy. He wipes his sweating forehead with a handkerchief with initials. The interior designer looks worse than usual, pulling his sweater over his head and begins to feel cold again in his dress shirt. Late autumn, cold seeps through the floor to ceiling windows and a crowd passes by the outside. He orders himself a green tea with lemon and honey. I think I have a bit of a cold, he says across the table to a man a few years younger than himself. He remembers him well. It's little Ollie. He was four grades below them. Jesper mainly remembers him for all his brilliant forging skills. The older boys used his golden hand for all sorts of signatures, and the little guy made good money that way. All those certificates filled with terrible grades and notebooks full of red marks that needed signatures. Now little Ollie has grown a big brown mustache, and Jesper draws his own conclusions. Ollie is a copywriter, and mustaches are back in style. In certain circles, circles where innocence of nihilism and St. Mito's exotic poetry is appreciated, or at least it was two days ago, when the land where both St. Mito and old-fashioned mustache madness come from had not yet used an atomic bomb on another land. I guess the nihilism trend is over now, Jesper mentions bluntly. Ollie agrees vehemently. I should get rid of the mustache. I know, it came as a total bombshell to all of us. Sorry for the expression. We didn't... Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. Jesper interrupts him halfway through the sentence. A total tragedy. Why'd you call me, Ollie? I read an ad and I thought, I read the ad and I thought for a long time. It wasn't until the bang went off, you know, that I finally felt sorry. What the fuck, Ollie? What's going on? What are you sorry about? The mustached copywriter flinches in front of the suddenly beat red Jesper. He stares at him across the table. As Ollie tries to hide his gaze, an albino tiger in the distance takes over Jesper's role. 
Although the copywriter often comes here to make friends, he's never liked the ghastly taxidermy. Wait, I didn't kill them. I just wrote the letters. Why in the name of the Lord would you do a thing like that, something like that? I don't know, Ollie stutters. I was young then. I really don't know why I did that. Everyone at school talked about them after it happened. Maybe I just wanted to see what would happen. Could they understand that it really wasn't Malin? One guy, this Ziggy, brought me Malin's old notebook and asked me if I could copy the handwriting. It looked easy enough and, well, I thought I'd give it a try. And did you send the letters or did someone else? Ziggy sent them. I just wrote. You know, I'm really embarrassed about it. You have to understand that I was young at the time and, well, I thought it was, I was a bit of a nihilist. And you have nothing else to tell me about it? You don't know anything about them? Even if, for example, I went to the police with this story, you'd have nothing more to say? Unfortunately, no. It seems that Ollie is genuinely sorry as he nervously smooths his mustache and Jesper stares out the window to Ostermom, his eyes glazed with fever. A group of people in dark clothes stomps past the window, his mouth reddening. He pulls his sweater back on and grabs his coat. Idiot! he says and leaves. Ollie stays behind to pay the bill. When the check is brought to the table, the albino tiger is still glaring at him. And this is good news, asks Mar and Margaret, and shakes the ash off her cigarette six hours later, outside. Plumes of smoke rise from her and Teresh Mahayek's mouths, and the steady light gray a steady light gray light seeps from the sky. She sits with three men on a veranda around the wooden table, and the breeze blows dark brown leaves to the floor. Jesper, having finished his story, feels uncomfortable. But then Khan jumps in. No, that's, that's not all. But look, what's remarkable about this is that 20 years later, in the place where the world is now, something new is still coming out. Meaning, there's still time. And I have a feeling that right now, that's why everything is coming out. That's, that something's in the air. The former minister sits with her back arched, her leg femininely over her knee. She remains dismissively silent, which cools Khan's enthusiasm. The man takes a sip of his coffee, or rather pretends to. There's nothing in it but stretchy sugar. Khan continues. Now, I don't know what you can make of this, I don't know what to make of it. I, for one, don't take it very seriously. Jesper interjects. Anyway, Khan continues a little grumpily. I'll say it myself right up front that I'll, that I'll, I take it. Seriously, I mean. We've just come from Lemminkainen. Right, a private consultant. He's quite well known, although he keeps a low profile. Self. Tadesh gives him a warning look and Khan continues. Uv is his name. Have you heard of him? I don't think I have. People go to him with things they can't get information about anywhere else. Stuck things. He's been involved in at least 12 death investigations. He's always helped in some way. Generally, the police don't exactly boast about it, but Tres can assure you it's true. Former agent Bahayek nods his head. He can feel her eyes on him. And though he tries to behave as one would on the job, trying to be rigidly respectful and trustworthy, it doesn't work out well. We love the girls. We love them more. He's so embarrassed by his thoughts before. At first, he tries not to look. Then he looks up. For a moment, his eyes, of random color, cross with Anne Margaret's tired emeralds. His methods are the kind that will not be mentioned later in an, invest an official investigation. Tadesh begins... It's a tacit agreement. With the prosecutor's office, such a thing would give the defense too much to grasp. It's kind of a power detective. I understand? Under pressure from the media, the police, together with the municipality, finally excavated the entire west wing of Ringhal. The psychic rolled his eyes and kept pointing, but all that came out of the concrete foundation was even more concrete foundation, and that's just one specific case. I've seen my fair share of necromancers. She allows herself a trace of bitterness. Teresh signals to Khan to wait. 
When I do my job, I don't do it for the state. I do it for the victim. Talking like this, he forgets himself. His confidence returns. He's again an agent of the collaboration police, not the leaf in the wind he has made himself out to be. And so I don't care how the information comes where the inf how and where the information comes from as long as it's productive admittedly i haven't been to this particular private consultant unfortunately he only deals with cases where the victim is already dead but he has an undeniable gift in this case for example ulf himself has been a suspect in eight different cases he's advised if that sounds authoritative to you and it does to me frankly Completely unconnected cases and no evidence has ever been found against him. You understand? The woman thoughtfully puts on a cigarette and then, when Teresh offers her a light, Khan takes the opportunity. He leans across the table and blurts out, He doesn't know anything about the girls. And what does that mean? She stumped. Khan looks back at her with a broad smile. He doesn't know anything about them. He has no information about them. A blank page. He doesn't know where they are. He knows nothing about their past. No secrets. But that's the point. He doesn't know anything because they're not dead. The woman is secretly horrified. Her ladylike posture unchanged. Teresh notices something suspicious in her reaction. But out of great respect, he cannot yet tell what it is. And the same consultant says that. And Margaret looks at him questioningly. Khan places a pad of paper in front of her. These are my notes about the girls. This is the summary I gave him. His notes are at the end. You'll see that these are all are the exact words he uses. Not dead. And Margaret is browsing, at browsing the papers. All the misery of the world flashes before her eyes again photocopies and dates a chronology of events Khan continues it's customary to give another envelope for such an occasion if the accuracy of the first can't be verified at the moment it's the girls we wouldn't have a clue on that alone the accuracy of the second proves it and guess who's not dead yet Khan pulls his second envelope out of his pocket and places it on the table it was only when Tadesh finally saw it that he began to seriously consider Khan's strange experiment. Sigismund Berg is written on it. Jesper doesn't know anything about it yet. He watches, his neck craning curiously. I give him I gave him Ziggy. Khan is on a roll, losing himself, speaking directly to Jesper. The connections he draws in the air become increasingly fantastical. How one assertion from a paraspecialist proves another, dotted lines leading to chaos, a label proudly proclaiming, axiom, and then the letters, how they absolutely must figure out what became of the slouch in the leather jacket, an arrow jumping to indicate what could come out of it. All could come out of it. Only Teresh, who has already heard it, is still watching Anne Margaret's reaction. There is none. The woman is just staring at a page in the girl's folder. Outside, it is slowly getting dark, and it's cold. She has pulled up the collar of her coat when Teresh catches her eye. She doesn't respond. She's been reading for a while, just zoning out, her familiar dark green irises standing still. What is that barely perceptible feeling deep inside? Teresh thinks he knows. How her eyes are slightly squinted, the unfamiliarity. She remembers. But what? The evening is approaching, it's getting dark, and Khan is burning like a light bulb in the middle. All around, in the quiet village, the air is crystal cold. The man leans back on a folding chair and wipes his glasses with a triumphant expression. Beside him, Taresh decides to go for the easiest solution, reaches out his hand and takes hold of the edge of the folder. She still holds it in her hand, not having managed to turn the page yet. May I? He asks. Yes, of course. That's nods on Margaret. As if waking up, she adds, It's all very confusing, I, I have to admit. Meanwhile, as Khan explains how the mother of the children should now turn to the police, Teresh looks at the four photos of the Lund children in the folder. Khan has arranged them in a row by age, like beads on a string. 
and Margaret closes the garden gates after the departing guests. She waves gently at the back window. The taxi rolls along the gravel road. It's no longer Kenny at the wheel. Kenny has long gone to his own Kenny world to do Kenny things. They're 40 kilometers from Vasa, and the white country house among the chestnut trees can't be left behind fast enough. Secretly, they all feel a sense of relief when they leave, somehow embarrassed too. No one can say anything. The gravel scrunches under the wheels. At the end, Khan tries anyway. She like, didn't seem very happy, or so. Jesper blows his nose. I had this daft idea myself. So what do you think we should have done? Not tell her? Let her figure it out for herself? Like what was up with those letters? Yeah, yeah, they're not dead, Miss Lind. Your children are alive. Alive children. You couldn't just let her guess at that, could you? She had to have the mystery solved. For a little while longer, they sit quietly and stare out the window. Village roads pass by. The machine rattles and Teresh asks the driver if it's okay to smoke inside. The match flickers in the dim light and cigarette pour paper crackles in the flame. Astra fumes waft around the cabin. It smells bitter. After so long in Kenny's machine, it somehow feels treacherous to sit here. Khan's conscience begins to sting, but maybe we really shouldn't have done it. What if she's reconciled and we've just irritated her for nothing? What if nothing comes of it? You think? Jesper says sarcastically. Maybe it was our duty, rushing into a stranger's home and telling her about her children. He thinks for a moment, then starts again. I don't really think so, Khan. I don't think she's reconciled or anything. Maybe she's just trying to get on with her life. I'm not a parent, of course. Tedes pulls an ashtray out of the door. He smokes in silence. They avoid the network of motor carriages and congestion there. That's why they drive along the village lanes between the evening fields and forest thickets. Halfway through, he's on the sixth smoke of the, uh, and the cabin is getting stuffy. The former agent is polite. He rolls down the window and fresh air comes in, along with a few snowflakes. They float to the edge of the ditch outside. The bare bushes whiz by and snow begins to fall over the fields in the distance. She's not reconciled, says Tres. She's forgotten. I didn't see any pictures of them in that whole house. She was looking at them in the folder of yours, too. As if she was trying to remember who they were. Khan shivers from the cold. No one says anything. That means acceptance. There's another long pause before Jesper flinches. This is how they let each other know how it makes them feel. Rarely do they talk to each other about what they really think. All because of the disappearance. It's all because they talked too much in the beginning. So much that talking no longer helped. Everything had been said. They have nothing to console each other with. That's why it's so strange for everyone to hear Jesper say. Sometimes it seems to me that the whole world has forgotten them. They have, says Teresh. And Khan says, let's go find that cocksucker. Let's do it today, says Teresh. Khan then asks, where do we go? To Grad, says Teresh. And they both look in Jesper's direction. Davai, says Jesper. With darkness comes a snowstorm. They're driving through the streets of Salem and the city around them freezes. It's the first time this year. The cold, sweet smell of the snow permeates the cabin with Khan as he enters with a large suitcase in each hand. Trails are left behind in the front of the house. His old mother stands in the doorway, shouting something, but no one can hear what it is. The machine is already speeding and the snow whirring, whirling in the street's tunnel outside. The snowing, it's snowing the whole time they wait for Jesper in front of the house. Two hours. It already looks as if they might not get onto their nightly magnet train. White streaks drift into the wind from, stir, from fir trees and black motor carriage is and the black motor carriage is buried under the snow. Finally, Jesper arrives, white suitcase in hand. How did it go? Well, let's just say it didn't go very well. He replies. Drive. They drive east fast. 
They ask the taxi driver to go faster, but that'd be dangerous. The wind drives stripes into the headlights. It's chaos flying everywhere. On the roads, in the orange halos of the streetlights, Teresh throws money at the driver and leads the way, glancing at his watch. He runs across the snowy square. The sound of taxi doors being shut behind him. He doesn't care that Jesper just left his things behind at his house. Jesper's only regret is that he didn't find his hair scrunchy where he left the lingerie model. He could have been better. That's a pity too. He's running, suitcase in hand, snowy in his, snow in his eyes, and all sorts of remarks come to mind. This fashion thing, with this fashion thing you see, it's, it's, it's no good anymore. This model thing is no future. You're gonna take my house, you're gonna live in Vasa. It's not safe to travel. It's, it's time to go to work for real. It's night, but there's a crowd in front of the elevators. They're shouting. Teresh flashes his fake documents. Collaboration police, get out of here. He's no longer Somerset Ulrich. He is now Cosmo Konstalovsky. Cosmo is not a missing is not a missing agent. He is Teresh's own brainchild. To confuse the trail, no one can follow it. Only then, when the jam-packed elevator cabin lifts them up above the city, do the boys sit down at their on their suitcases to catch their breath. The city's buried in snow, and its gleam seeps into the exhaust fumes of the motor carriage of motor carriages, turning them into set, saturnine green. Golden, orange, until the darkness of the train station swallows them up. The elevator doors open, and they run under high steel arches of the station building. There too, at night time, a crowd, uh, a crowd awaits them. It is packed everywhere, in the waiting room, in front of the ticket counters, even though the display billboards uh, show that there are no available seats, and the girl with a baby voice from a speaker confirms it. Even the flight to Samara, the SRV, the day after tomorrow is sold out. Yes, this is the degenerate bureaucratic worker state where you want to be. Not to mention that at that very moment, in Grad, the irrigation grid disappears, and a tidal wave rises threateningly over Yekokata. Where are you running? Stay home. Join the army. They squeeze themselves onto the platform. It is snowing under the high night sky when the corridor stops them from stops them there in front of the five-fold slat, slatted door of the magnet train carriage. Teresh does something he never does. Cosmo Konstalovsky, authoritative flashes his... Cosmo Kontalovsky's authoritative flashes no longer have any effect on the conductor. Numbed by the frenzy of the people, the girl with the baby voice announces the imminent departure of the flight and asks everyone to step behind the yellow line. Already they can hear the hissing of the train's hydraulics. Teresh puts his hand under his jacket and reveals a pistol. The leather pouch of the holster hangs under his arm. Mahogany handle firmly in hand, he steps through the doors onto the luxurious dimness of the train, gun barrel gleaming, and the conductor retreats before the service weapon. Behind Teresh, Khan and Jesper slip through the doors. The door slams shut, the magnets roar, and one of Khan's suitcases is left on the platform. Teresh puts the pestle back in its holster and apologizes to the frightened conductor. They're not used to such things here in Kalta. Katla. The ex-agent thanks the woman for her cooperation and returns to diplomacy. Outside on the platform, the huge buffers are detached from the train. The umbilical cord is cut and released from the coupling linkings. L links, the train sinks onto the magnets with all its weight. They hum at full power beneath the carriages and then the flight begins. The force of the magnet pad makes the net makes the north sea behind let me try that again, excuse me. The force of the magnet pad makes the north sea beneath them split in two. It's quiet inside. The generators humming at the train rushes 50 meters above the water. They stand together laughing. Teresh extinguishes his cigarette in a bronze ashtray and they turn their backs to the window and leave. Ahead lies the pale, and beyond that, the big world begins. Somewhere there, in its cities, on its streets, in its steppe expanses, is Sigismund Berg, the only person in this world who knows what happened to the Lynn children. In the windows behind them, in the city, 
Only light pollution remains, a golden glow in the distance, in the midst of the snowy, stormy darkness. Yeko Kata. Yeko Kata. Okay. Yeah, a nice little train ride. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think um I think the beginning of that chapter in particular really uh spelled it out, underlined it. Oh, did it now. <laughs> <laughs> From every aspect. Yeah. Uh, all the questions I feel like in theories were pretty much just like cemented at that point. It's like, yes, moving forward, this is what's up, you know? Um, this is where their characters are at. This is where, this is how fucked they are. And the fact that um, Khan literally sees the ghost of Melin with him throughout the 20, throughout the 20 years is. Yep. Everything like we said formative years, big event, and they're stuck in there, and they grow having passed like one of the most powerful moments in their lives, mm -hmm. and they never grew out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the like his his collection. Like the scrunchie was the first sign of something being off. You know, it's like why do you have a like memorabilia of this you know and uh it's like you know the the person is literally from that moment in time is literally floating in his head you know um it is interesting though because yeah we're seeing uh i guess like all of that getting uh uh uh, uh clashed against um non-entity that's what it was called right the process of becoming a non-entity um and i mean yeah hard confirmation on everything with jesper right so not, hard confirmation not, not much to say there yeah um and then like uh yeah <laughs> the 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 the, the brief revishal and in, in like mention as well in passing um yep a few hours ago mm -hmm. that happened mm -hmm, mm -hmm. shout outs to the innocents uh it is i had a thought earlier too about um oh, fuck what was it about uh, was it Teresh? Was it the mother? No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the horror of going back to the mom and just and being like, her that. "Hey, have some hope. It might be okay." Actually, yeah. like, and them going like, <laughs> and them talking about it after and going like, "Did oh, she forget?" That's did, did she like put it all like behind yeah. her and she's just waiting for everything to end? that's that's insanely brutal yeah. um i mean if it's not the non-entity process occurring there then it's just like you are fucking torturing this poor woman you know um yeah and this is definitely a much more up close look at the pale than we've gotten prior right and i mean of course it makes sense it's it's the titular uh, it's the name of the story but um it is it, it, it is interesting to see like the description of like people trying to get away from it but you know some people are doing so via evacuation some people are just d grabbing their people and going and other people are just like eh i'm not going anywhere and that's and that's very real life you know in any disaster in any moment if you're like this is certain death by the way you you do need to get up and leave yeah. and there's always people that are like ah, i'm not going anywhere i don't want i've that. seen other things <laughs> you know it's like or your I've priorities two revolutions i'm old yeah or your priorities are elsewhere you know you're just you're just legitimately like i i don't give a fuck what happens i'd rather die than leave where i am and that's always uh, wild, but it happens every single time something, you know, be it war or tsunami, 
you know what I mean? Breaks out. So, um, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, dragging up the past for a poor mom. Kind of cringe. <laughs> Slightly cringe. <laughs> unless, unless there's something to it. Um, yeah. Okay. So we are going to leave it there at chapter 15. <sighs> yeah, that was intense. All of these sessions are intense, actually. It's a part of that is almost because I feel like, I feel like we touched on this last time, but when you go through a story, like, I feel like part of the way we're used to going through um, stories, especially considering, you know, let's be real, like we we consume, you know, fantasy media and science fiction and stuff and, and on a regular basis, you're desperately trying to latch on to like a good person. You're looking for a protagonist. You're looking for something or someone to root for or to believe in. And when you don't get that here, you know, when everywhere you turn, it's just like flawed. Uh, flawed. flawed is a kind way to put it, you know, like disturbed all the way up to shitty people. Um, yeah, it, le it leaves you with an overwhelming sense of anxiety. You know, like, as you're just like, oh, uh, like, you're the only ones left that give a fuck. But also, like, um, but also, that chapter describing them getting lost in the fervor immediately afterwards is super good and definitely, like, locks in that obsession for the rest of your life, right? So you have the most formative moment of your life in, in, in your for most formative years and the biggest thing ever happens and then gets ripped away from you in the most traumatic way possible. And you have each other, but like the whole world- Oh, you're separated from that. Yeah, the whole world yeah. is just all about the, like it becomes this thing where you can't even really, no one will even believe you that you guys had any kind of special relationship at that point. So you've got each other and you talk to each other, but then you talk till you're blue in the face and there's nothing left to say. So you're just left with this fucking emptiness and this like that, that feeling of describing the way things were immediately afterwards for them is like, Oh, that must be fucking horrifying. Yeah. Right. And they turn on each other and they leave each other. And yet all these years later back together, sharing those same memories again and going through it again and, yeah, I mean, you need another 20 years of therapy to start un <laughs> unwinding the knot that start that occurs at that time for the kids. Yeah. But um yeah, that that feeling of absolute helplessness at a time when you feel compelled to to affect the world the most. Um that's a crack you don't put back yeah. together. You and know? knowing that like search parties they go home the dogs everything wears everything off everything wears off and there's nothing and you're left alone with that mm -hmm. and at the end of the day even publicly there's not even the like oh now to their boyfriends to the set you know or whatever it's like no then well, you're a bunch of kids who the fuck are you yeah. even the mom is like i guess you're hanging around longer than the others you know and now to this part of it right so um that's brutal that that particular part of the chapter like was like okay yeah i i fucking just i feel that yeah. right that domino leads to the to the place we're at now so um chapter 15 of 20 let's leave it there 75% <laughs> <laughs>